Welcome to this episode of Moments in Leadership. First, I'd like to thank some of my new supporters, Greg Hall, who subscribed at the Hot Wash level, and William Casey, who subscribed at the Buy Me a Beer level. Thank you both very much for supporting the project. For those of you who want to help out, there's always the free way to do it, which is write a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or leave a five-star rank on Spotify or subscribe on your favorite player. Everybody knows all this stuff because I keep saying it over and over again, but not that many people do it, so I'm just going to keep saying it. Uh, also, merchandise, some uh, new stickers are up with some of the quotes that everybody seemed to like so much, and you can buy those on the link in the bio. Quick note on some upcoming guests. I have Jean Marine Sullivan from United States Navy. She is set to drop in early March. Lieutenant General Greg Newbold and Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy Manila and Lieutenant General Furness are all recorded. I just need to get them edited. I've got Vice Admiral Bill Mertz, a submariner in the United States Navy, and Colonel Steve Davis, who is General Alford's regimental commander, are scheduled to record coming up here in the next couple weeks. I heard from Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. He's going to come back on in May to do a final recap of his career as he moves out of the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps role. I'm still networking to get some other senior enlisted folks on the show. It's just harder to convince them for some reason, so I'm working on it. And then finally, I'm going to do a hot wash in March sometime with as many people in that group as as are available. So before I introduce this episode's guest, I want to share some news about a recent announcement of Moments in Leadership joining forces with the folks over at the Lethal Minds Journal. Everybody likes to talk about their why. It's very popular. I like Simon Sinek too. So here's my why on this project. I just really want to provide a resource to help other people figure it out faster than they could on their own. The other reason why I like doing this is I just like doing it. It's fun. I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy getting to know them. And I enjoy the new people that I'm meeting and becoming friends with at the same time. But one of the things about this project that's been very difficult is it's extremely time consuming. Trying to juggle something that I really enjoy doing, which is this project, with the demands on my time from the other aspects of my life is just hard. I think as members of the military, we all learn to just deal with the things in the short term while looking for solutions that are more long term. And I think I found one. My main goal is to make sure I keep putting out a high quality product that can be used by emerging leaders to keep getting better. My secondary goal is to do it in the most time efficient and effective way possible. When I started talking with the folks over at the Lethal Minds Journal, I realized that one of the other reasons I really wanted to keep going with this project is I just want to be around other great people. And I think I found that with the folks over at the Lethal Minds Journal. I like the idea of being part of a group rather than just a solo practitioner. And I like what they're doing there and the products Lethal Minds Journal is putting out. I'm looking forward to making moments in leadership and the Lethal Minds portfolio an even better product. The resources that I'll have through affiliating with them will only make this project better and will help out with some of the things I've been struggling with on the effort that goes into the project. A few people have asked if I thought joining up with a revenue generating model would hurt my ability to get guests. And that's a fair and legitimate question. My hope is that obviously not. And here's why. After I pay off all my personal expenses out of the revenue that's generated, I will donate every dollar of that to Patrol Base Abate and any other future veterans organizations if the success continues. I have a normal job and that's where I make my living. This is a passion project for me. I just don't want the expenses to bury me, which I think everybody realizes is fair. So that's my commitment as it relates to money. So stand by for more on Lethal Minds Journal, but I just wanted to let everybody know why I decided to go ahead and join forces with them. And with that, I'd like to introduce my guest, Colonel Reggie McClam. This is a great episode because Colonel McClam and I have only recently gotten to know each other. But after this interview, I felt like I had known him forever, and I think you'll feel the same way too. He's a fantastic leader doing great things down there as the CEO of the basic school. And we've heard from other guests on other episodes about what a great product TBS is putting out, not only in the infantry community, but across all the different communities. And I believe he's one of the major reasons why. We have a really awesome conversation about race, diversity, and creating opportunities. His perspective on this made me, a Gen X white dude, realize two things. One, we're actually doing a pretty good job in the Marine Corps. And two, we can always be better as long as we keep trying to be better. And that requires some conversation. Colonel McClam gives some great tips on how to talk about this, and I really appreciated his candor on the topic. Colonel McClam was born in Raleigh, North Carolina, and was commissioned a second lieutenant following his graduation from the University of North Carolina at Pembroke in 1997 with a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice. He completed a Master of Arts in Management and Leadership from Webster University in June of 2010. Colonel McClam's assignments include operating force tours with the 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions. 
He commanded infantry units at every level from platoon to battalion and also served as assistant operations officer and operations officers with infantry units. As a platoon commander in 1-7, he participated in two unit deployment programs to Okinawa, Japan. As a captain and as a major, he completed three combat deployments with 3-8. The first was to Ramadi, Iraq. Subsequently, he deployed as the helicopter-borne company commander with Battalion Landing Team 3-8, 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit aboard the USS Kearsarge. His last deployment was to Helmand Province, Afghanistan, in support of Enduring Freedom with 3-8 reinforced, Special Purpose MAGTAF, Afghanistan. Colonel McClam was the commanding officer of 3-8 for eight months in 2015, he also served as the acting commanding officer of 8th Marines Regiment, Remain Behind Element, and subsequently he commanded 1-8 for 21 months and deployed as East Coast UDP Battalion to Okinawa, Japan. Colonel McClam has served tours outside the operating forces to include tactics instructor, staff platoon commander, and infantry officer course instructor at the basic school, military aide to the president at the White House, and MAGTAF planner 0505 for Marine Forces Central Command. He was the Ground Combat Arms Lieutenant Colonel Assignments Monitor, and most recently he served as the Branch Head, Manpower Management Enlisted Assignments. Colonel McClam's professional military education includes attendance at the Infantry Officers Course, Advanced Mortar Leaders Course, Army Airborne Course, Infantry Captain's Career Course, Expeditionary Warfare Planning Course, the Army Command and General Staff College, Red Team Leaders Course, and the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies where he earned a Master of Philosophy and Strategy. He is also a distinguished graduate of the Marine Corps War College. Colonel McClam's decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal, Bronze Star Medal, Meritorious Service Medal, Navy Marine Corps Commendation Medal with a Gold Star, Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medal, Army Achievement Medal, and Combat Action Ribbon with a Gold Star, the Parachutist Badge, Presidential Service Badge, and in 2021, the Marine Corps recipient of the Black Engineer of the Year Award. Colonel McClam is married with three children, and so with that introduction, Colonel Reggie McClam, welcome to Moments of Leadership. Thanks for taking the time out today, sir. I will also note that to listeners, not that they can see this, but this is my first in-person interview. No, mostly this is over Skype, so it's actually kind of fun to sit across the desk from somebody and yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Talk right. So thanks for coming on. I always like to open the show by giving listeners an idea of who I'm talking to. So you know, who's Reggie McClam? Where did he come from? How did he? Be, how did you become a Marine? Like, what was that moment? I'm the byproduct of Michael and Alice McClam, originally from Garner, North Carolina, but my dad was in the service. He was in the Air Force for 20 plus years, retired as a master sergeant, was an aircraft mechanic, and really probably laid the seeds and foundation for where I'm at now. More importantly, I traveled and lived all around the world. I lived in Europe for quite a number of years, in the UK and Italy and traveled extensively, lived in North Dakota and Louisiana, California, and, you know, North Carolina. I just, I really had a broad upbringing in my early years. But I went back home when my dad was in the final years of his time as an as a airman, uh, and I wanted to go to high school, and I knew I wanted to go to college in North Carolina. So in the last years of my dad's time in the Air Force, we moved back, my sister and I, to North Carolina where I completed high school. I graduated from Garner Senior High School in 1992. And then uh, I was a track and field guy, played football in high school, it was a lot of fun. But ultimately that led me to the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, Pembroke State when I went. Really great school, small school in Southern North Carolina. Amazing opportunity. Back in the 1880s, it was an Indian normal college. So the Lumbee Indian tribe is actually down there. Oh, wow. But I went there on a track and field scholarship, so great opportunity. To What'd you do in track and field, though? Because I was a, that's a quarter a big... miler. Okay. I, so I was a 400-meter runner, 200-meter yeah, awesome. guy, 4x4, four 4x1, four, four but the 400 long jump were kind of my things, but the 400 was kind of my ticket. I was a you know, mid to low 48 guy, 48 seconds, so I was okay. What are you now? Man, you know, <laughs> on a good day, yeah, yeah. considering yeah, I'm more like, seasoned right yeah. now, I bet you I could probably go out and crank out a good 50, 51 I was going to say, yeah, okay, you know, under a minute. If I'm pushing it now, I'm going to have to Stretch. curl up in a ball and, right, yeah. you know, recover for probably three days after it. But, you know, I try to try to keep myself physically fit. But I ended up going to the University of North Carolina, Pembroke, graduated from there. I originally started off as a biology major. 
And then uh, I recognized I didn't want to be in a lab. So I switched to my last year to criminal justice. Probably drove my parents crazy uh, doing that, but it was important to me to kind of chase what I felt like I wanted to do in my life because I wanted to be either a highway patrolman or a police officer. Ironically, I saw how much highway patrolmen and police officers made back then, and I changed my mind when the police route, law enforcement just wasn't working out. I recognized that the military was good to my family. So literally just a couple of months before I graduated, I was like three months from graduation, I think, uh, remembering back then. And uh, I signed up enlisted in the Marine Corps. That's what I thought, you know, my pathway was going to be. My recruiter, Gunnery Sergeant Rogers at the time, really close. I mean, he set me on the pathway to the Marine Corps. And it was really funny. Ironically, I started out going to see all the different recruiters. I went to the Army recruiter. I went to the Navy recruiter. I went to the Air Force. Coast Guard was trying. In Lumberton, North Carolina, they were all in the same recruiting station building. One door of four stickers. One on door, it, right? yeah. you know, and, and there's, you know, all the recruiters are around each other. Army and the Air Force and the Navy were pitching hard. I mean, yeah. they were like, hey, you know, look. And I was about to be a college graduate. I did okay on the entry-level exams. A couple days went by. I was coming back and forth. And then finally, I walked by the recruiter's office for the Marine Corps, and uh, I walked in, and I'll never forget, Gunny Rogers looked at me and he said, he said, I knew when you were ready, you'd come in here. I was sold hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. You oh, know, that's awesome. I, I'd signed, I think, that day. Um, Open but contract? I, what did you do? Did you negotiate an MOS? Yeah, or? so, no, I didn't. I, 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 uh, I mean, he was a aviation ordinance man, so... You know, I was probably looking a little at aviation, but more importantly, I was intrigued by the infantry. And I, I think I, I'm pretty positive I was an open contract uh, back then. But I got to the MEPS station, got all that stuff done. And then uh, at MEPS, you know, they're like, hey, get off the bus. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, you got a acceptance to, to OCS. Oh, you didn't even. OK. So I applied to both. So when I when I actually showed up. My recruiter was really great, and he was like, hey, look, you know, you got all this stuff going. You're a natural-born leader. He sent me, I mean, catch this. It doesn't happen often. I know people have their stories, but he sends me to Raleigh shortly after I sign up and listed. Okay. And he makes me go see the OSO. And at that time, it was a, an officer by the name of Captain Tingle, uh, former infantry, now out of the Marine Corps and still a, a close friend of mine. Both of those individuals, Gunny Rogers and Captain Tingle, set me on the pathway to the Marine Corps. Now, when I switched to be an officer and let go of, you know, the enlisted route, I knew I wanted to be in the infantry. So OCC then? So OCC class one tac 67 or what? one tac 167 at that, that time. Still 96? Or so we that about was, I signed up 97. I went to OCS in 98 and just. Great time. I mean, OCS was fantastic. All right. What was the hardest thing of OCS for you? Because everybody's got their thing being, that they being find Being in art. the classroom. I didn't like classroom okay. work. I, I mean, I was an okay student in college. You know, I wasn't like fantastic, but I love being in the field. I love being outside. I spent a ton of time outside with my father mm -hmm. growing up and, you know, on the flight line with him. And, you know, I was in the sports really heavy. So anything in the field Anything physical fitness was my wheelhouse. Like that was my jam. You know, I was a gymnast in, in, in school coming up and, you know, beyond track and field. So, I mean, as a young second grader, right. third grader, I could flip an entire football field, just backflips all the way down the field. I went to a small school in Goldsboro, North Carolina called School Street School, and they didn't have a lot of equipment, but they had mattresses in a room and everybody in that school. <laughs> I mean, I literally taught myself how to flip. Do oh, backflips, wow. okay. you know, at an early age. So that was kind of my thing. Ended up going to the Marine Corps. Um, and, and, and I haven't looked back since. It's 25 yeah. years later, here I am, you know, from OCC straight over to, you know, TBS. I started in Charlie Company, and they gave us an opportunity to switch. Uh, things weren't going so great. I really wasn't doing well in that company. I would probably would have graduated in the bottom third. Academics um, or was yeah, it just, I just assimilation? Just the, it wasn't the assimilation because I was a military brat and like 
you know, particularly as an African-American male coming into the Marine Corps mm -hmm. back then when, yes, there were black in the Marine Corps, but there weren't a whole lot like looking at the infantry in the Marine Corps, you know, always had a little bit of a, a stigma with the way that we were bringing, you know, people of color into the Corps. I mean, more importantly, I came to the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to be a Marine. And, and that's sometimes lost. Like at the end of the day, it's a volunteer organization. I wanted to be with the best. Uh, from that day that Gunny Rogers looked at me and said, like, I knew when you were ready, you come in here. I haven't looked back since. Right. You know, it's been fantastic. It's that joke that we all share of, you know, you'll never hear a Marine say I was going to join insert other service, but. But yeah. everybody says I was going to be a Marine. Be a Marine. Yeah, yeah, right. I love whether it. they mean it or not. I know. Yeah, you we know, all hear that's it. what yeah, they say. Right, but, right. you know, I ended up uh, moving from Charlie Company and I went to Delta Company. And my SBCs at the time were world class. One's retired now. One is actually still in and is a senior leader in the Marine Corps. They set the tone. I mean, they were so inspirational and their example has followed me today. I mean, the students at the basic school probably don't realize it, but they're benefiting from that foundation and underpinning that I got from all those yeah. captains and majors years ago from OCS to TBS. You know, I went to the fleet, my first duty station at 1st Battalion, mm -hmm. 7th Marines as a rifle platoon commander, and I was frankly, the embodiment of what I had gotten from OCS and TBS. Sure, my parents were extremely instrumental in my upbringing, and they gave me the tools to be successful. You know, my dad always set the tone. You know, he had that kind of philosophy, you know, don't share my money, share my work ethic. So I had mm -hmm. a very strong work ethic. You know, I'd outwork people, not the brightest guy in the world, but I'll work hard. And then my leaders, you know, that I was surrounded around early on set me up for success. Yeah. You know, ironically, I, I can say this really holistically 25 years in the Marine Corps. Now I've never worked for a poor leader. That's, I, I, I that's, think some that's amazing. Say you're that, you're the but, first person like, in my life that's I've ever never said that to me. worked for a poor leader. That's great ever. to hear. Every immediate leader I have now, everybody has their quirks and nuances. But I'm talking about where I looked at somebody and said, I, I, I don't want to be them. They might have some nuances that I'm like, eh, mm -hmm. not quite the leadership sure. style I want. I can refine it. But they were all man or woman, all bright, all articulate, all passionate. And I took leadership lessons by the droves from them, mm -hmm. you know? So to me, that's really, really critical when you're thinking about what kind of leader you develop into. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of it's the people you're surrounded by. And I was surrounded by some really phenomenal folks. So I'm dying to ask a question about, you know, you're a lieutenant and now you're the command officer of the basic school. So I promise I will come back to that. Right. Okay. But, but if I ask it now, everybody will drop off the podcast. And not listen. So we're going to ask it. But, but, but you have these phenomenal leaders at TBS and that that's really great. And you made me just for a second, reflect back on my time at TBS. And, and, and I share that, like, there were people who I, I said, I don't want to be like that person. I, so I totally get that. But all of these inputs are all learning inputs for leadership, right? Even if you see somebody that you don't, their, re, their leadership style doesn't resonate with you. It's still formative, yeah. right? So you, you get through TBS, you, you get through IOC, and then you get to this magical point that everybody who sits in a classroom when you talk to them comes in and is a new class wants to get to, which is that moment that they stand in front of their platoon for the first time. Whether it's an infantry platoon, it doesn't matter, right? They're standing in front of the people that they're in charge of, the men and women that they're in charge of. What was that moment like for you? Oh. So I show up to 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. You know, I'm a, I'm a young rifle platoon commander, newly married. 2000? Uh, so that's 1998, 99. Okay. I show up uh, to the desert. So here I am. I'm a, I'm a desert rat now. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I was excited to go to 29 Palms. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get away. So I show up to the high desert. I'm in a historic battalion. 
you know, in yeah. one seven Bravo company. Okay. I was Baker company. I was a Ridge runner, third platoon. And I got a phenomenal platoon sergeant retired now, but just, he was the epitome of what I thought of an enlisted Marine. He was physically fit. Mm -hmm. My, my squad leaders were fantastic. One of them is a chief one officer five. He's a gunner right now. Wow. You know, a division gunner. And, and so that just tells you the kind of people I was surrounded around. And, and people can say when it comes to leadership, they can say a lot of things. But who you're surrounded around, that input is really, really foundational and critical to the type of officer or leader you become. I think that's, that is so important for everybody. First of all, everybody listening to this needs to rewind and listen to that last 30 seconds again. Because... So you're, you're so right on that because we all like to joke about the new lieutenant, right? I mean, okay, yeah. all, to, to, let's go ahead and get the laughter over with, with everybody who's listening to this as an enlisted Marine, right? There's that, okay, I get it. But at the same time, you have, as an enlisted Marine, you have an opportunity to develop an officer. They are a piece of clay that you can mold just through your example or how you're working with them or anything like that. And, and that's such a fantastic leadership point to make to everybody who listens to this, which is like, hey, get your jokes out of the way. But at the end of the day, right, if you're a platoon sergeant, you get a brand new second lieutenant, you could possibly be the the number one biggest impact on that young officer of Jeez. anybody else that come out, TBS, IOC, all of that stuff. They, they set the tone it's, for me. They set it. I, I, I have to just be straightforward. I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. What I did know from IOC, I was aggressive. I had fellow platoon commanders, my two fellow platoon commanders. One's a regimental commander now. The other is a chief of staff. And they're two of my best friends. We were in each other's weddings, you know. And, and let me put this in, in context for you. I show up to this unit. You know, there's not that many African-American officers in the unit. It's just a couple of us. Like three? There were three of us, actually. Okay. Three. Four. One officer. Um, mixed heritage. So, you know, not having that officer, not sure how they would identify, but there weren't that many, which that was a lot for a unit back then. You know, there were some guys who mm -hmm. were, they were one up. I ended up being that, you know, over time, but those young squad leaders and the platoon sergeant, those initial impressions, the way that they would correct me to say like, Hey, sir, you ought to do it like this. Mm -hmm. Building that trust that you have to have. Yeah. You know, when it comes to leadership, you know, trust can be a force multiplier. It can be as powerful, you know, as a tank battalion in the assault, or it can destroy you like one if you don't have that trust built with your yeah. small unit leaders. Right. And they were really good at helping me adjust as a new platoon commander, as well as me telling them, this is what my intent is, and this is how I need you to carry out the mission. It was a back and forth, which mm -hmm. I think. That's the key to leadership. You know, it's a back and forth dynamic going back and forth. Platoon commanders, you know, I was newly married. And frankly, that marriage didn't work out. You know, we could talk about that in another story. But those platoon commanders saved me from myself. Because I went a little bit into a dark place, as anyone would. You got a brand new bride. You're in front mm -hmm. of your squad leaders. You know, one of my squad leaders told me what was going on behind my back. Bold, you know, bold. Just, yeah. Good but, for him. But, but not bold. Let's think about it. Think about the type of environment, Dave, that you have to create where your small unit leaders are comfortable coming to you with something so intimate and personal and telling you like, sir, we care about you so much. You need to be aware that this might be going on. Yeah. Those platoon commanders rallied around me when I was going through, you know, the dissolution of my marriage and, you know, I was coming out on the backside. They helped me. They set the tone for me to come back even stronger. You know, the true test of any man or woman is how they bounce back from adversity. And that was one of the adverse things in my life as a career Marine. Mm -hmm. You know, I was worried about how I was going to be viewed. My battalion commander made me go on leave for 30 days. He's like, you got to get out of here. Okay. You're, you're out. You're still a second lieutenant. When this... I'm a second lieutenant. Yeah. Okay. He's like, you are leaving. 
he found me in the office late one night. It was like two in the morning. He's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. It's because I didn't want to go home. Yeah. You know, because my home life was kind of, you know, wonky at the time. So I didn't take 30 days leave, but I went home for 15 and, and I got with my father. My father came back out with me and we moved out of my base housing because I had to move out of base housing. I had to move out in town. I moved into a tiny little apartment mm -hmm. right off of Adobe Road there in 29 Palms. Yeah, I mean, sure. I'm very it familiar. It was like, yeah. Uh, Four or five hundred square foot, you know, okay. it cost me like two hundred dollars a month. There's and probably a lieutenant living in that very right. place right, right now, now, right? Yeah. Right now, <laughs> uh, the place is still there. I mean, yeah. I drive by it every time I went out mm -hmm. for palm fexes. Years later, when I came back as an instructor at, at TDS, you know, and we're going back out there, I'd ride by that place. But really great years for me in my rifle platoon, and then I transitioned from there. I did pretty well as a platoon commander. You know, battalion commander asked what you want to do, and I'm like. I want 81s. Okay. So, you know, good young answer, lieutenants, yeah. right. you, you want 81s, you want cat, yep. you know, some guys are really enamored with being an XO. I wanted no parts of being an XO. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I want a war fighting unit. Yeah. I want to be one of the battalion's assets. Mm -hmm. So my battalion commander at the time gave me the opportunity. He's like, Hey, you perform well, you get that opportunity and can't tell you how instrumental that was from a leadership standpoint. So he gave it to you. He gave it to me. Okay. Yeah. And, and my platoon sergeant at the time, you know, had moved over from 311. He was phenomenal. Gunnery sergeant. He was a Met guy. And then my two section leaders, one of them was a staff sergeant. Uh, the other was a sergeant. The sergeant is a California highway patrolman now. He and I are super close. The staff sergeant at the time is a guy by the name of Staff Sergeant Gordon Hay retired chief warrant officer for Gordon Hay, unfortunately is not with us, but boy, you talk about a man who shaped, I called him Sundance. All, everybody that was with him, his, his call sign was Sundance. Mm -hmm. Sundance changed my life as a Marine officer because he was the first person as an enlisted Marine to teach me how to talk to squad leaders. He was your platoon sergeant he's, in 81s. He's my platoon okay. sergeant in 81. So he's a sec he, was a, he was a section leader and then he moved up to be a platoon sergeant. Mm -hmm. He would go back and forth in what we had going on. So, so explain that for a second. So what was it that he did for you? Because this is, this is valuable for people who listen, right? What was it that he did for you that was so formative when you say like he taught you? Yeah. So, I mean- he looked at me and he was like, look, you keep tasking me with stuff, sir. You and I, we talk about doing things. These Marines actually do things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he went and grabbed, you know, 81s, it's eight cannons. I got eight squad leaders right. in, in 81. So it's a big platoon. That's, you know? yeah, I mean, my I platoon get, was right. close to a hundred folks. I mean, it was huge. And, uh, he brings me in and he's like sitting these squad leaders down and he's like, you talk directly to them because they're going to do things for you. I'm here to help reinforce what's actually going on. I'm here to help, you know, your vision and intent come to life, but they do stuff. And then when I figured out like that secret sauce, mm -hmm. you know, it, it changed my perspective because I now got sets and reps. You know, if you think about Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 reps right. and that whole piece, I was getting sets and reps, actually looking squad leaders in the eye and talking to them one v one about what I wanted to get done. Both tactically, mm -hmm. you know, personally, professionally, he was it. Many years later, a quote that he often said that I didn't recognize that we were doing both together at the time. He would say, you know, hey, sir, if, if, if you're not tired, you missed an opportunity to be great. Right. I was exhausted because of him. Yeah. Because he taught me how to do it. He taught me how to exhaust yourself into leadership while also, you know, achieving the other things you want. Now, I probably did that too much. I mean, we can talk about that later here in the podcast, like, mm -hmm. you know. We were talking a little bit earlier, you and I, this work-life balance thing. Yeah. You know, I, I told you, I, I'm not a big fan. Personally, I don't tell young officers there's a such thing as work-life balance. That's fake news. 
It's not real. Sometimes your career, particularly if you're married, my balance now is, and where I actually, and, and it's not even really balance, you know, because I, I told you I don't necessarily believe that where my convictions are now through some of my experiences in the core are you're looking to achieve harmony. That's what you really want. You want harmony, right? Because sometimes your career is really important. When I was deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, I couldn't think about my family when I'm on patrol or I'm in this COC and I'm clearing fires and we're troops in contact and all those things are going on. You, you can't have family on your mind. You have to be focused on the mission and what you need to do. Your tactical prowess has to come out at that time. You know, you're making decisions in a time compressed environment. Sometimes your family has to be more important. So in my last job, in my last billet before I took command of the basic school, when I was in manpower, man, my family was at the top of my list. I was pouring in, like I was paying the family bank. We're going on vacation here. Yeah. I'm going to take the kids to school because at the time I knew I was selected to come to TBS. My wife knew, hey, I'm going to have to start pulling out of the family bank because right. I got long days and you know, I get here early in the morning. I'm staying overnight in the field or, you know, doing things with, you know, the staff and the cadre to shape the future of the officer corps. So you got to have that balance in regards to how you think about you know, work and life, achieve harmony. Mm -hmm. If you can get to harmony, that's probably winning. Yeah. You mentioned before that you, know, you were married early on. Mm -hmm. Were you learning some of those lessons back then as a second lieutenant, or did you not realize that stuff until you got older? No, I, it was when I got older. Okay. I could say in my mind, I thought I was learning them. I was not. Look, my, my career was dominating a big portion of what I wanted to do because the Marine Corps is so competitive. Yeah. It's just competitive. If you want to be a commander. And I knew when I left the basic school, I knew I wanted to come back to TDS. Like that's, that's the kind of influence the two SBCs had on me. When I came through, it was a two SBC system. Okay. I don't even know what that means. Yeah. So per platoon. So the traditional model at the basic school is you have a staff platoon commander mm -hmm. and they, you know, years ago, it would just be the staff platoon commander. And then we have an area down there called war fighting where all the captains who do the instruction are downstairs. Okay. When I came through as a young lieutenant. I think that's how it was when I came yeah. through. Like I had a staff platoon commander. And that was it. That was it. Yep. Right. One staff platoon commander. Mm -hmm. You had your, your typical XO. XO, CO. Your company commander. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And then all of the enlisted Marines were an instructor battalion. They were the aggressors. Right. Those of you who are more seasoned. We all remember the Centralians. Mm -hmm. It was the Centralians. Yeah, that was right. the aggressor force. Yeah. We've now advanced the model here. Yeah. Um, and you have what we call enlisted warfighting instructors inside each platoon. So there is a captain and either a corporal or sergeant who are both, you know, go through instructor education program, highly qualified to instruct lieutenants here. They make kind of a command team, if you will, to model for the lieutenants what mm -hmm. a platoon commander, platoon sergeant squad leader mix kind of looks like. So that was a powerful piece kind of coming back. I knew I wanted to do that Yeah, from my SBCs kind of leading me back then. So I would say to the question you asked earlier, did I know, you know, did I learn those lessons about this kind of leadership piece back then? Not really. I mean, my career was dominating my life because I wanted to be at the basic school, which means you had to do really, really well in your first tour so you could get your battalion commander's nomination to come back to TBS. Sure. So I got that. From the time I've left the basic school till now, I've never been in a take a knee job. You know, some people are like, hey, you got to get a take a knee job. That's mm -hmm. not real. I mean, I'm just saying that even as a former monitor, I'm like, Tell me which boss I can call in the Marine Corps and say, hey, you got to take a knee job, Billet, in, in your command. You know, <laughs> right, that I can yeah. take a knee and, and catch my breath. That's not real, I don't think, in any command. But even more so, if you want to lead and you want to ascend to some of the greater opportunities in the Corps, and that's not everybody's jam. Everybody right. doesn't always want to mm -hmm. do that. But if you want to achieve that, man, you have to perform. Yeah. 
you got to be a performer. And, you know, my watch work, what I tell all the young officers here at the basic school, what I've learned over the years, performance is the currency by which we evaluate all future potential. Yeah. The Marine Corps is competitive. And I love it that way. I mean, I'm, I'm a sports guy. Most of us come to the core because we're looking for that challenge. We want to be on the cutting edge of all of that fervency and zeal that, you know, codifies what the Marine Corps is about. Right. Like that's just an important part of what we do. So. Yeah. Nobody looks at Tom Brady and remembers if he had a crappy game no. in college. No. Right. If, yeah. if you want to excel in this business, you got to perform. Right. Yeah. Regardless of your background, regardless of where you came from, you know, we all start off here where we have the opportunity to excel. I'm not saying it's fair, you know, and I, I, I learned over the last four or five years in particular, you know, 2015 to now, 2015 was mm -hmm. a, a, a critical year for me. You got to take fair out of the lexicon. Some things just aren't fair. And that's okay. Yeah. But what you do with it, what you do with the opportunity is really the key. Yeah. There's that saying, fair is something you pay to take the bus. Yeah. You know? That's right. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, great <laughs> anecdote, a great analogy. I mean, you know, what you want to do is you want to create an environment where everybody has phenomenal opportunities. You know, I yeah. watch that here at the basic school all mm -hmm. the time, you know trying to set the students up so they have great opportunities for success. And it starts now. Right. It starts with the way you mold them now. But it wasn't until years later, really 2015, that's when I learned the lessons that we're talking about. That's yeah. when it all came into sharp focus for me. Right. Um, and I know that was a pivotal year for you. And I, yeah. uh, we're going to get to that because, yeah. you know, I, I even just having getting to know you pre-recording, you know, I don't even really know that whole story. So yeah. I know that was really, but before we jump ahead too far, I'm kind of curious. I haven't heard you talk about your company commanders very much from the time that you were a lieutenant. <laughs> are there are there some? Did you learn anything from your company commanders that was that was formative or influential to who you are now as a full bird yeah, colonel? Absolutely. My first rifle platoon commander, who will remain nameless, but just I learned from him what it meant to go all in on your lieutenants and take care of them at every right or left turn. Even when we were knuckleheads, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and the two other guys I told you that we were rifle platoon commanders together, of which one is a regimental commander now, and the other is the chief of staff. We were knuckleheads. I mean, okay. we did dumb stuff. I feel you know like what I mean? my like buddies were knuckleheads too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we just right, did yeah. dumb stuff, you yeah. know what I mean? And, and, but our boss, he held us accountable. So mm -hmm. he held us account accountable. But boy, he went to bat for us even when we did knucklehead stuff. Yeah. So he was just truly instrumental in showing me again, you know, you can argue all kinds of points about every leader you work for on whether they were phenomenal or not. He was an above average officer. Probably he would tell you that himself. I'll tell you what he really was. He was absolutely crazy where you think the subordinates should be loyal to the senior. I never felt that way. I always felt like my boss at the time was super loyal to us, yeah. which is w weird when you think about it. But huge culture building. Huge culture building. I mean, we had a tight company. And because of that, the kind of moniker that the three of us took together as platoon commanders were, we're going to make our boss look like a rock star. Wow. Like, I mean, think about that. Yeah. Like, in, I mean, and I do that to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, my boss right now. I want to try to make my boss look like a rock star. Just do the right things. Right. You know, that's not kissing somebody's tail. That's not doing anything unnatural. That's just do your job, do it well. And your boss looks phenomenal. Right. You know, you take care of them while you're also taking care of your subordinates. Because if you're doing all that stuff right, everybody wins. Right. You know, but my thing is, Create an environment where people love coming to work every day. Ooh, I'm not I saying they're going to, I'm not saying that they're going to mm -hmm. love the things that you task them with, but I want the young Marines at the basic school, the officers, 
the civilian Marines, the families, I want them to love stepping on Camp Barrett. Yeah. I want them to look like, I want them to feel a certain type of energy. Right. When they step on this school and they're like, this is a great place to be. We all seen it. You, you, you've been places where you walk in and you can feel the tension in the room. Mm -hmm. That's command climate stuff. Right. And command climate, in my opinion, is dictated by the leaders. What's a good way for, okay, I'm not well versed in what, uh, like, and I'm using my air quotes here for listeners, like mm -hmm. a command climate, like a real, I don't really know how that works. So parking lot that for a second, but what's a good way for a commander to figure out what the command climate is without a command climate survey? What are some things mm -hmm. that you, from your past, you'd be like, when you walk into a command, whether you're a brand new Lieutenant walking into your platoon or you're a battalion commander walking to battalion, what, what are some of the red flags that you see or the indicators of command climate, either positive or negative? Yeah. I know you've done this before and you had a senior leader on here who, who went into a whole, you know, litany of things here but the first thing that i think every marine leader would point to is discipline mm -hmm. discipline discipline is a key indicator you know are your marines walking around in the proper uniform do they wear their kit correctly you know are their hands in their pockets you know are they doing the fundamentals really really well you know i mean it, it's funny not to frequency hop on you but as the CEO of the basic school, one of the things I have to do in kind of reminding young officers here is they come in, they're so smart, they're tech savvy, you know, mm -hmm. they can tell me all about, you know, force design 2030, talent management 2030. They've read all the things that are going on in the world. And I'm like, all that stuff is fantastic. And you're going to get an opportunity to do that soon but I just need you to go find a little red box in the middle of the woods. <laughs> Land nav. Just, right. I just yeah. need you to be, go, yeah. go. And I use that as analogy to say, you know, you have to be tactically and technically proficient. Mm -hmm. Because if you get that right, when you show up at your unit, you can be a lot of things as a Marine officer. There's two things that you cannot be. You can't be weird. Right. True. Can't be weird. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to be weird, you can mitigate it with some tactical prowess. You need yeah. to be tactically and technically proficient because then you're there weird. The Marines right. will rally around you if you're weird. Yep. Because you're there weird, but they know when the bullets start flying and they move to the sounds of the guns that their commander, she or he, knows their business. Right. They're competent. You know, so that's the essence, I think, of, you know, what you have. So I think discipline is one way that you can figure out the command climate in the unit. I think another way is for me as an infantry Marine where war fighting is the coin of the realm. Mm -hmm. Everything we do in the, in the Marine Corps is focused around war fighting. I mean, look, here's the deal. Again, my opinion only. I'd like to believe that a lot of Marines would back me up on this, but and if it's not, if it doesn't have anything to do with war fighting, the Marines are mildly interested. Sure. Like the institution writ large is kind of mildly interested if it doesn't have anything to do with war fighting. Right. Like that's our business. That's, mm -hmm. that's what our senior leadership tasks us to do. You know, I mean, it's, it's our title 10 authorities to the nation. It's what the taxpayers pay their money for. So if it doesn't have to do with that, it's, it's, it's mildly interesting. But I, I'll tell you the other thing that you can look at outside of that discipline piece is what are the programs, i.e. the things that often get overlooked as a leader, fiscal, maintenance, mm -hmm. warehouse operations, you know, I mean, it's all these combat service support MOSs that actually allow us to go war fight. Right. I think as I matured as an officer, I learned that those administration, the awards, you hear it when you're a young officer here, but it becomes real when you're the responsible, accountable officer for a unit and you're trying to set the tone for a great command climate. Because right. I'll tell you, it's just like, you know, here's the anecdote. I always hear people say like, you know, he's a great field Marine. Well, he's not really a great Marine. 
If he's just good in the field, that doesn't just cut it. You can't just be good in the field. You got to be good in garrison too. So you can't just be warfighting focused only, but all the things that underpin warfighting are not good in your unit. That's command climate. Right. Because that means you're neglecting all the other folks who actually support the unit in its overall mission set. So I, I would just say, I think that's really important as well. Yeah, I think those things about measurement, it's so, well, it's impossible to measure how, I'm going to use an infantry battalion. It's impossible to measure how good or how well an infantry battalion can go out and exercise violence and kill the enemy unless they're doing it. So in the absence of being able to measure that on a Monday through Friday in garrison, what are the things that we as leaders look at as measurement tools? And those are some of them, the, the discipline. So when people say like, well, does it really make me a bad warfighter if I stand around with my hands in my pockets? Well, no, maybe not necessarily, but the indication that you're giving to somebody is those are the measurement tools you use in the absence of being out on the, the battlefield. And that's what people are using as, as a measurement. In the field, when it's cold, I get it. Common sense has to apply. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times we forget that too. We, we don't apply common sense to leadership. So in the field here at TBS, when it's cold outside, I'm going to put my hands in my pocket. Yeah. What I'm not going to do is put my hands in my pocket when I'm here on Camp Barrett, you know, because this is not the contonement area. This is our main side. And it's important to kind of model for lieutenants what right looks like, mm -hmm. you know. So how they carry themselves, not walking around in boonie covers around main side, not putting their hands in their pockets, putting on T-shirts and doing those things. I do that now here because for me, it's an indicator of discipline. And I also want to model for those that may not be in the infantry and may go to other places across our corps to serve. Like you don't want to show up and be the young officer who's walking to the exchange with your boonie cover on and garrison. Right. You know, because then somebody's going to call you out. Right. You know, and it's your professional reputation is affected now, you know, and once you start losing your reputation or your personal brand or your personal brand, it, it just, it sinks. You yep. can't get it back. You know, it's just like trust. Once trust is lost, it's really, really hard to fill that bucket back up. Right. It doesn't fill up as fast as it depletes. It depletes really easy. It doesn't regenerate as quickly. You right. know, I'd love to say that we were all Wolverine and we could regenerate very quickly, but it's just not real. Right. That's a portion of it. I think those are like two kind of things when it comes, you know, discipline and then really start looking at the things that underpin a unit, the things that are not on face value. If you start digging at those things and they're really off kilter, to me, that's command climate mm -hmm. because now you spend more time trying to correct those things that takes away from your ability to continually and consistently prepare for war fight. Right. You know, now you can, you got to turn it back into preparing for war fighting as you correct it, but you could be focused on other things if that stuff is okay. Right, right. That's great. You may not recall this because you meet a gazillion people every single day and I don't meet new Marines every single day. But the very first time I met you, within 30 seconds of our initial conversation, we got the pleasantries out of the way. Hi, nice to meet you. You and I start talking about boonie covers. And I don't, I think it was because we were walking from your CP here over to the Hawk, and there were some Marines in boonie covers and some Marines in yeah. regular H. It's driving covers. me crazy. Right. Well, and, and you said, and, and I asked you because when I came in the Marine Corps, right, like, you know, I'm going to sound like Archibald Henderson here, but when I came in the Marine Corps, <laughs> you know, we didn't get issued boonie covers. I mean, you could, some units would let you buy them and wear them, like scout snipers wore them, but they weren't an issued item, and now they are. And I asked you, I said, when do they get to decide? And you answer it. You're like, when they're in the field, it's issued. They're allowed to wear it when they're coming back from the field or going to the field. Like, so if you see Marines and boonie covers here, they're either coming back from or going to the field and then they're not. And then this is what you said to me. You said, this is where I teach the lieutenants when they can and can't do the little things that are going to eat into their personal brand or their reputation when they get out to the fleet. And, and you, you explained that to me, like, that is part of the, the, the thing that you're teaching lieutenants here. It's funny because you brought the boonie cover up thing. That was the very first thing you and I ever talked about. When we met each other. Yeah, I will tell you. So, you know, personal brand and reputation, to me, those are so critical in the development of the officer. I was getting taught these things by my senior leaders, and I didn't know it was happening. As a lieutenant. As a, as a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. But years down the road, 
I kind of codified it and said, okay, like, hey, I understand now what this is all about and why it's so important. But there's something to be said about your reputation. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about your personal brand. Because if those are in alignment, they ultimately affect your relationships, good or bad. Okay. How people connect with you, mm -hmm. whether they want to be around you or trust you or want you on their team is a really critical piece to, to this whole thing. And so I have a mentee document. I've shared that document with you. You know, I give it to all my mentees that, you know, I track and, you know, meet with and break bread with, have breakfast with. I'm a big fan of mentor mentee relationship. And that's even changed. We can come back to that at another time, but you know, the, the short of it, I'll say this. When I was coming up, I always felt like mentors chose you. So I look at a young officer mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm going to be your mentor. Right. That does not work in this modern era to me with the generation of young leaders we have. It's a relationship. I may want to be your mentor, but I need you to want to be my mentee. Because at some time in that relationship, you're going to become the mentor and I'm going to become the mentee. It happens every day downstairs with lieutenants. Because mm -hmm. I'm from a different generation. I grew up differently than they did. You know? Yeah, absolutely. 49 years old. They're like 22. Right. I mean, we're, they're, they're we're literally a whole different generation. A whole different generation. Right. So some of the things that come natural for me doesn't come natural for them. And some of the things that comes natural for them doesn't come natural for me. But I will tell you, a lot of our connective tissue is built on relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's built on my personal brand and my reputation, what they know and see about me and what I know and see of them as young officers here to include my staff more importantly, mm -hmm. who's even harder sometimes than the young lieutenant because they, they, they know, right? Yeah. You they've know, got experience and they've got experience, you know, but leaders have to do kind of four things. And this is in one of the classes that we teach. It's not my original thought. I inherited it from my predecessor. Who's one of my you know, closest friends, but leaders have to be clear concise, consistent, and the last C, the four C's, the last C is connection. And to me, when you talk about connection, connection goes back to relationships and personal brand. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the whole dynamic of leaders can be a lot of things, but they can't be weird. <laughs> right. Because we all grow up you know, going to high school and we know what the word click is and there's clicks mm -hmm. in high school and there are all kinds of different clicks, right? But then when you get in the Marine Corps, the connection is driven by something completely different. So what is it that establishes a connection between a mentee and a mentor? What is it that, is it, I guess it, the easy answer you could give me is they're tactically and technically proficient. So, so yeah, don't say that, say yeah. something else. Yeah, I, I, I won't say that. I, I, here's what I will tell you. When you get a mentor-mentee relationship, I use two different words. There's coaching and there's mentoring, okay? As an infantry officer, I am most capable of mentoring folks who are infantry officers or those that are most closely connected with combat arms because I have experience you know, sets and reps, if you will, of working in that environment, the combat arms arena. Mm -hmm. But let's just take, for instance, if you are a manpower officer or if you are a air traffic control officer, what I can best do for you is coach you. So that difference between coaching and mentoring, you know, mentors they actually have skills and expertise inside the community of interest, community of practice mm -hmm. to help you advance your personal and professional goals. A coach, in my mind, may not have that expertise, but can talk to you broadly about overall success as an officer. 
Okay. So like, that's how I kind of manipulate those two. I think that's great. And, and, in in coaching and mentoring and, and, and breaking those two out, it's unidirectional. It goes back and forth. You know, if it's a one way street, that's sort of how I felt like it was when I was a young officer is like my mentors talking to me, you close your mouth and you listen. Okay. I don't remember really questioning my mentors back then very much. I mean, cause I wanted to be them. I just kind of looked at them. I'm like, yeah, I think whatever that right. person has going on, I want some of what she has. Mm -hmm. like, I, I, like I want some of that. Like, you know, I want to be her. She's crushing it. She's in command. She's. I want to emulate that know, person. I want to emulate mm -hmm. them. I think now that's a little bit different. We're in an all out fight for talent. Agreed. It's a, it's a fight for talent. You know, this is what our senior leaders are up against. This is a part of how we're adapting as a core. We'll be left behind. We're, we're fighting for talent on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So you have to approach the officers much different now. And that's a challenge for some. It's a challenge for those of us that are a little more seasoned. Not right. old, but, but seasoned, yeah. you know. It was probably a challenge for Colonel Kelly when I was at TBS to relate to my generation. Yeah. I mean, this is not a new problem. No. Or, or a new challenge, I should say. Yeah. It's not. And, and, and that feeds into, you know, that key to success. You know, I, you, you've read the document. I talk about it a little bit. But, you know, that acronym that I use in regards to what I think officers need to be successful. M O A S. Mentorship, opportunity, advocacy, and sponsorship. You get that in some form or fashion, I think, as an officer throughout your career. I'm telling you, the only reason that I'm sitting here right now in the billet and have the roles and responsibilities that I do is because officers that are senior to me, enlisted Marines who are senior and were subordinate or peers with me, family members poured some portion of this acronym into me over the past, you know, 20 plus years. As a young officer, I was getting tremendous mentorship from, from senior leaders, okay. from young Marines, from family, you know. The Marine Corps offered me opportunities, okay? Okay. But, but senior leaders in particular, officers who were senior than me, gave me the opportunities I needed to achieve my personal and professional goal. Because when I was a young officer in 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, mm -hmm. because of the battalion commanders that I had, I knew I wanted to be a battalion commander back then. Right. I knew it. Like, I was like... I want to do that. My wife will tell you. I mean, she met me as a first lieutenant. You know, we've been married, uh, you know, 18 years. We've been together for 20 plus years. And she tells me, she's like, you know, I remember when I first met you, you were like, man, I want to be Italian commander. I achieved that goal, but I achieved it. Yes, I had to perform. So performance mm -hmm. is, is a must. It's part of, you know. The Marine Corps is a meritocracy. It, it's a lot of other things too, but merit matters. You, you got to perform. Mm -hmm. But I got tremendous mentorship opportunity. And frankly, I got a ton of advocacy and sponsorship. Two totally different things. That advocacy, you know, really promoting someone's expertise, their brand, their performance is advocacy. But sponsorship, and again, this is, this is my own personal belief, mm -hmm. but sponsorship really can only come from senior leaders. I'm talking general officers and above, because that's when they're placing their reputation, their personal brand, their influence as senior leaders. They're almost placing their rank on the table to say, look, I know that the institution or you as this person's leader, you really want to do this with this officer or, or enlisted Marines, but I'm telling you, they're going to go do this because I can see the future potential in this person. And if we don't set them up now, then we won't be able to play them later. Right. You know, we got to be able to play them the right way. So what you do with those opportunities, 
Right. Like that's, that's the golden rule. That's what makes this so special. I mean, that's why I love the Marine Corps. But I heard you say something different. Well, not different, but when you talked about sponsorship comes from the general officer level, I'd like to challenge you on that a little bit because I think I heard you say something early on in your career that did show that there was some sponsorship in your career. And I, so I'm going back to your 1-7 story. Yeah. So you, the, your performance as a lieutenant mm-hmm. gave you an opportunity mm-hmm. to be the 81's platoon commander. Yes. And – and then from that, your performance there gave you an opportunity to then be sponsored by your battalion commander to come back here to TBS. So there is sponsorship opportunity performance. These things are happening at yeah. lower levels. It's not somebody listening should be like, well, yeah. the sponsorship doesn't happen until I'm in 06. And I'm so here's what it. I would challenge. Uh, here's a little bit of my pushback for, to you. Me coming to TBS, I look at that as advocacy. I'm still such a young yeah, okay. officer mm-hmm. and there's the pool is so big, you know, that you can do that. But, you know, here's the way to think about it. This is, again, a perspective. I fundamentally believe that from lieutenant until major, it's about who you know. So I'm teaching young officers here, mm-hmm. personal brand, relationship, having them go to the hawk and be in the club kind of arena where you get sets and reps and you get introduced to people for you to increase, you know, your value proposition to folks. Right. Like that's a, that's a skill set that you have to learn how to do. It allows someone to advocate on your behalf. So as a young officer, it's about who, you know, Mm -hmm. when you become a Lieutenant Colonel and Colonel, here is where it changes. Those populations are small. There's 600 plus colonels in the Marine Corps. Right. There's 1,600 some odd, you know, lieutenant colonels, give or take. You know, Mm -hmm. there's more than that. It's probably about 2,000. But it's relative relative to the 21,000 officers we have. Lieutenant colonels and colonels are really tiny. But they're all competing for very limited opportunities. We have tons of company commanders. I mean, I have 121 captains downstairs. Yeah. God, she's crazy. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So like, yes, battalion commander advocating is good. I wouldn't say he was sponsoring. Sponsoring okay. is when you are at the senior leaders and you are almost at times doing something that may be unnatural to the normal system to advance, promote, or put somebody in a position that they that you as a senior leader believe will be influential to the institution long term. Okay. Like so that's kind of the breakout. I mean, I think you could get there but you know, th- th- at least when I was writing the document and I was going through my mind of what this meant, it's more profound because of the second and third order effects. Like yeah. somebody might be disadvantaged in a sponsorship move. Somebody else might have been aligned to an area that like you're, you know, a particular individual is supposed to be going to. And a senior leader comes and says, hey, I know you guys are going to put this person in there. Well, really, we're going to put this person there because okay. it's better for the institution. Right. That happens. Again, sure. mm-hmm. anything I'm saying now, I'd argue, happens at Amazon, happens at Google. Happens, of course it does. Happens at Taco Bell. It happens in my company. You and know, 10 people that work there. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, it happens on the, it happens with seven-year-olds who are playing backyard football. Mm -hmm. There's a hierarchy in there. You know what I mean? Just think about the picking order. So I I lay that out as a dynamic between the difference in advocacy and sponsorship, but I do fundamentally believe they're all important to how we achieve overall success. What I'm saying more importantly is when you're young, it's who you know. What I have found as a senior leader now, lieutenant colonel and above, it's who knows you. And all of Uh, that was predicated on what you were doing when you were a young officer, when you were building relationships and Mm -hmm. personal brand. All of that now matters. Right. It all comes back. Your past doesn't, you know, leave you behind. You know, so if, if, if somebody wants you to be on their team. A lot of that comes from the senior leader who says, you know, you ought to really do this. Right. You know, you and I getting connected together. You know, frankly, I'll be honest. I hadn't heard of the podcast. 
You know, I hadn't listened. Come to find out that all the young Marines are, you know, they love it. And it's big. And a senior leader turned me on to you and like, hey, look, you ought to talk to him, you know? I'm not saying that that's sponsorship, but it's advocacy. It's advocacy, yeah. That's what I would say. You know, right. and it's built on reputation and what they think about you, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's an important piece for young leaders as they're coming up is to understand the landscape, you know? Here's my basic word for it. I'm always trying to improve the playground skills of the officers as they go through the period of instruction. Right. You got to learn how to play on the playground. You, absolutely. And that's, that's a lot you of what TBS is. It is. You got to right. learn how to play with everybody on mm -hmm. the playground. Yeah. Can't just be a tetherball guy. Can't just be a kickball guy. You know, you, you can't be just only four square. Right. You got to learn how to move around the playground and adapt to the environments that you're yeah. in. And frankly, that's leadership. Because mm -hmm. you got to do the same thing leading young Marines who are diverse and from all over the nation with different backgrounds, with different makeups, with different issues and problems. I mean, that's why I love being a Marine. More importantly, that's why I love being an infantry officer. Yeah. You know, I get sets and reps on it every day. Especially you know, here. Every day. How often do you just walk out of your office and go to the field and just walk, walk up on a company out there? Are, I mean, do you do that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it must be fun. I get, I get, you know, there is something going on here all the time. Whether it's live fire, field event, you know, they'll tell you, I love e-course, double O course. I love going out and watching the patrolling, you know, mm -hmm. watching lieutenants and the offense and the defense and how they're making those decisions. And frankly, you know, I try to employ the captains like this is the place to actually fail. Like make a mistake here. Mm -hmm. Better to make the mistake here than make it in the fleet. Right. Or even more so, in make combat. it in combat. Right. But yeah, it's a special, I'll it's bet. a special kind of feeling and it's, yeah. it's great. I was having this conversation. So on the podcast, I had uh, Lieutenant General Bellin on and I don't know, somehow we got off on this conversation. I was like, well, how do you stay in touch with the sergeants and the corporals when you're a three-star general, right? Like there, there are HESCO barriers out, you know, out your office door. Like you know, sergeants aren't just coming in and saying hi to you. And I don't know if you heard him say this or not, but he tells the story. He says like, a lot of times I'll just say like, Hey, gentlemen, I need to, I need to find the head real quick. And somebody say like, well, sir, I'll take you down. Like, oh, I can find it by myself. He goes, and then I'll just take a left instead of a right. And I'll just walk into somebody's office and say hi. <laughs> yeah. And I look at that and I think if I was the CEO here, I'd want to be out there all the time talking yeah. to the lieutenants and everything like that. There's balance. But, I mean, sure. you gotta, oh, yeah, yeah, you gotta, right. you gotta find the, <laughs> you, you still have a job to do. Yeah. Well, right. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I spent a lot of time on some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. because it really is important. And that's admin and the fiscal and the money and the facilities, you know, like that stuff still makes, you know, the, the, the motor T and the maintenance, all that has to happen mm -hmm. where there is no opportunity to actually produce the legal, lethal graduates that we need from the basic school. Right. So that th producing that lethal graduate who's imbued with the service culture, you got to make sure that all the other stuff that actually makes the wheels go round actually works. Right. You know, and right, frankly, that's a lot of my folks in my combat arms and combat service support MOS is at the lower levels. It's infantry platoon, it's weapons platoon, it's combat arms platoon, it's, you know, the artillery instructor battery, it's the Marines in Motor T, it's my supply folks. You know, it's my admin office. It's the folks over at the armory. You know, I mean, this, we have the second largest consolidated armory in the Marine Corps. We're the third largest armory over writ large. You know, there's armories that are bigger than me inside training command, but it's massive. Like, yeah. it's huge. The amount of effort and time, it's, it's nonstop. That cycle you know, the young Marines here last year drove 164,000 miles. Really? They Boy, transported, I, I don't feel like anybody drove that much when I was they in TV. transported we more than 110,000 personnel, all in this, wow. you know, between here and TA-16. Like the amount of work that goes into doing that and keeping the vehicles run. I mean, we've all seen the equipment we have. It, it's constant maintenance. Yeah, who signs that CMR? You know? Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, 
the logistics director and the team here is just amazing, you know? Right. But is this where you get to the difference between mentoring and leadership? So can I use that as an example yeah. of uh, mentor, mentorship and coaching? So you're an infantry officer, you're the commanding officer of the basic school, but you just rattle off some things like fiscal, right? So you're not an expert in those things, no. right? So you're coaching those leaders who have this expertise in an area that you don't, but you can walk across the street and mentor the captains at IOC. Yes. Right. And, okay. and, and in turn, this is why I said it's unidirectional. Mm -hmm. Those young Marines, those young officers are often mentoring me as I'm coaching them about That's what I was success. Getting at. Right. I'm coaching them from the standpoint of running a large organization. Mm -hmm. I have the experience to know what right looks like, how to ensure that all of these disparate parts are connected together and they function properly. But they're the SMEs telling me, you know, like, if you do this, this is the consequence. Now I can weigh it based on my experience of how we actually tackle that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, leaders in particular, I'll say commanders more than leaders, because there sometimes I, th there is a difference between commandership and leadership. But commanders do three things for a unit. Three things commanders do for you. The first one is they provide vision and intent. The second is prioritization. What are the priorities? The third is resource allocation. So it's a unidirectional relationship between coaching and mentoring, depending on what subjects we're talking about, for me to actually ensure that those three things are being executed on a daily basis. That's just a part of the back and forth that we have as coaches, mentors, as seniors and subordinates. I mean, there are times here yeah. where I'm, look, I go over to IOC and I'm talking to young captains and I like to believe that my tactical prowess is okay, but those guys are in <laughs> yeah. the throws every day. There's, you know, 15, 16 captains sitting around every day talking mm -hmm. about nothing about but war fighting. Right. You know, offsets and SDZs and, you know, min ranges and, you know, just all the things, you know, grazing fire, enfilading fire, you know, reds, risk estimated distances, and just the tactical employment of weapon systems to achieve a combined arms effect, you know, that allows you to close with and destroy an enemy by fire in close combat. Mm -hmm. You know, the mission set of the infantry. I go over there sometimes and I'm getting mentored. I'll bet. They're breaking out new gear and new ideas that I haven't even fathomed yet. It's what's awesome about being a leader. Right. Yeah. How, how you do it though. And I, I subject myself to like, yeah, teach me. Tell me what you're doing. You know? I may be able to come in over the top with some experience that makes them think about a problem a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, right then, I'm, I'm the mentee. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm being mentored by the young captains and majors over there who are like, sir, let me tell you how this works and what we're doing. And I'm like, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that it's, part is amazing. It goes back to that generation thing, too, because if I reflect back to when I was here at TBS, I, I was joking with you the first time I met you. I'm like, this is the first time I've ever been in the CEO's office at TBS. Thank God. Thank God I've never been here before, right? But I never saw, I know his name, but I never saw him. He never came out to the field. He, he wasn't, you seem so much more engaged and I'm not complimenting you to make a point. I'm, I'm bringing that up because I'm about to make another note here. But one of the previous recent times I've been here at TBS is when I came with Lieutenant General Bellin and I watched him address Delta Company here, which is, I, I feel like was, I'm taking a swag here, but like half of them were prior enlisted. That's yes. a big prior enlisted company. It was a company. huge right. prior enlisted company. And so, so General Bellin and I were, were, were peers together. We grew up in the Marine Corps. So he and I grew up at the same time. And then I watch him as a Lieutenant General talk to a class of second lieutenants. And I'm telling you, they're asking him questions that my generation would have never dared ask. They're brilliant. I know. It was amazing. And so it gets back to this mentor thing. Like every single time one of those lieutenants was asking Lieutenant General Bellin a question, they were mentoring him. Yeah. Like it's that reverse, yeah. right? Because he, he's going to answer those questions. It's amazing. I think you all like that. You said before that you really like being challenged or, or you know, mm -hmm. debating, like respectful debating or yeah. things like that. Dialogue and discourse is really good. That's how you grow. And that's how you stay on the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to be in a point. 
I don't want it to ever be here at this institution where it feels like I'm talking down or I'm talking one way, you know? Right. It's one direction. I think that's how we grew up. Don't you think? Yeah, there's, there's a portion of yeah. that. Yeah. Like it right. was a, like the style was just different. I mm -hmm. mean, even our 21st century modern learning is changing with the way that we actually engage and teach lieutenants beyond just the Socratic method and the guided discussions and guided applications that we use now. It's a whole different world. Right. I think about it often as I engage them. You know, I get to teach three classes here at TDS. I teach leader one, which is an introduction to leadership. I teach leader two, which is inclusive leadership. And I teach leader three, which is really kind of my parting shots, them going out the door. But one thing I think gets lost on leadership, Dave, is this dynamic of how powerful other things are with regards to leadership. So let give me an give example. you, yeah. so I tell a, a story, I tell an anecdote in leader one, intro to leadership where we cover the five horizontal themes. And in this anecdote, I talk about Thomas Edison. You know, it's one of my favorite kind of stories to tell young lieutenants. And this anecdote about Thomas Edison is, you know, one day as a small child, Thomas Edison came home from school and he gave a paper to his mother. It was from his teacher. And he said to her, hey, mom, my teacher gave me this paper. Can you read it to me? You're the only person that's supposed to read it. What does it say? And his mom's eyes welled with tears and she read the letter out loud and it said, your son is a genius. This school is too small for him. We don't have the teachers to teach him. Please teach him yourself. Many years after Thomas Edison's mother had died, he became one of the greatest inventors of the century. One day he was going through his closet and as he was going through the closet, he found the letter that that teacher told him to give to his mother. He opened it and the letter stated, your son is mentally deficient, adult. We cannot let him attend this school. He is expelled. You th like, think about that. Yeah. I mean, what's the real, what's the real leadership lesson learned from that powerful anecdote? It's that Edison became so emotional reading it, Dave, that he went to his diary and in his diary he wrote, Thomas A. Edison was a mentally deficient child whose mother turned him into the genius of the century. You can't ever lose sight of the power of two things. The power of a positive word of encouragement and love. They can change someone's destiny. I believe that 100%. 100%. Mm -hmm. I tell that story every single class. I tell it at graduate. I tell it at the beginning and I tell it at graduation because I think it's so powerful because you hear senior leaders say it, but love is real. Yeah. It's I, one thing to love your Marines, which is what I'm advocating. It's another to fall in love with them. You can't right. fall in love with them. <laughs> yeah. You can't fall in love with right. them. Right. But you should love them. Right. And the ability to grab them, you know, my personal pet peeve anytime. I just did an NJP the other day, unfortunately. Always tough. Yeah. But at the end of every NJP, particularly when a Marine is found guilty of having violated some portion of the UCMJ. After we finish and whatever, you know, punishment has been imposed, I always tell Sergeant Major, take them out to the hall and let them stay there for about a minute. Then I bring them back in. And when I bring them back in, I stop and say, all right, look, punishment has been imposed, but let me tell you, you are a valuable member of this team. Mm -hmm. We need you. And nothing, the true test of any man or woman is how they bounce back from adversity. So you're about to show us your character, your reputation, your personal brand, all the things we've been talking about. Now this stuff is about to actually come out right. on how you bounce back from something that's tough.
I mean, I got real world experience in bouncing back from tough. So I feel really, you know, qualified to talk to the Marines about bouncing back from adversity. Like, hey, if you're if you got reduced to Lance Corporal, I can't wait for the day when you come in and you kind of got your swagger going on. And yeah, you're, you're walking and you're like, sir, I'm a corporal now. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. Like that's powerful stuff. So. Love and the positive word of encouragement, you can change people's destiny. I believe that, too. Here's a tangible example of that, I think. When I first came in the Marine Corps, these things, challenge coins, they didn't exist. But I never saw those things. But they, yeah. And they've gotten popular now, right? So if you give a Marine a coin, you're like saying like, hey, here, this is, this is positive encouragement. You did something that impressed me or whatever it was. And people love those things and they like them so much that they keep them in a collection. Yeah. Right. So that's just a <laughs> tangible example of, of, of words of encouragement. But I believe you, and I've experienced that as much in my civilian life as I did in my limited military life, which is, there's that saying, you know, praise loud, critique softly. Yeah. There's many different variations of the way to say that, but, but you're right. Because I think an ounce of admiration goes a long, goes way, a long way with the human dynamic, forget the Marine Corps, forget leadership, you know, forget officer enlisted, forget any of that, just the human dynamic of that. But you alluded to hardship. And I want to ask you to talk about that because in 2015 was the beginning of a pretty major setback for you that, that impacted your life and probably made you learn a lot about leadership and life. And, and I want to hear that story. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, part of this, I'll just label, you know, learning and leader, really learning and leadership through opportunity and illness. Mm -hmm. So. You know, using that as kind of the framework for this. In 2015, I was at the top of my game. I was at the pinnacle of my career. I was at what most Marines who are officers, particularly in the infantry, it's what most would say is like, you know, you've made it to the inner sanctum. Mm -hmm. And that's being an infantry battalion commander. I got the honor and privilege to do that when I was the CEO of 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines. Showed up there in 2015, you know, do all the preparatory work to get them out the door for a deployment. I deployed like five months after taking command. Mm -hmm. Like it was a tight timeline. It was just awesome. You know, did you or, or Afghanistan we went, Iraq? We or? went to UDP. So okay. we went to unit deployment program in Okinawa, Japan, or excuse me, correction, not UDP. That's after. That's the later part of the story. Okay. This is when we're going to. Special Purpose MAGTAF, AFUR, so Africa, Europe. So great opportunity. I've got a phenomenal team, excellent company commanders, and I'm at the height of it. You know, deploy the unit out to ITX, which is the old CACs that mm -hmm. you remember. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, so last iterations of ITX before it switched to what it is now, the MWX. And we do well you know, get our certification to the go deploy. And during the deployment, everybody gets the crud on the deployment. It happens. You, mm -hmm. you, you've deployed, you know, sure. everybody gets six. We're in a foreign land. You know, I've got a company in Spain. I've got a company in Italy. I've got one in Africa. I got one in Bulgaria. And then the rest of us are in Romania. All right. So I'm spread out all across Europe and Africa. I mean, just, awesome as a battalion commander to be able to just oversee that and prepare that and get that out the door. So I'm at the height of my career. Everybody gets sick while we're in Romania. You know, that's where my headquarters was at. You know, when everybody gets the crud, a couple of days later, a week later, everybody's recovering. I wasn't, I just wasn't feeling well, you know? And I like, a lot of people call me snacks. I like to eat. You know, and I love to <laughs> snack a lot, you know, even though I'm 160 pounds soaking wet, but I like to eat. I like food. I really stopped eating. Things started not going right. Bottom line, I fall pretty ill. At the time, the general officer comes over, who's a three star, to come visit us. And he had known me since I was a young captain. Okay. As soon as he sees me, he's like, pack your trash. You're coming with me. I'm like, he know. noticed physically. I mean, there, he noticed yeah. something was not right. I'm like, sir, I'm battalion commander. I'm, what do you mean? I'm not going anywhere. He's like, 
yeah, like this isn't me asking you. Go pack your trash. We're getting on a plane. I fly to launch stool and it gets pretty bad to the point that it gets so bad. I mean, I go tachycardic one time. So you, this is a rapid decline. Rapid I mean, this, decline. Yeah, I mean, okay. in like days, two days? weeks. I mean, two weeks. Okay. Because I went to civilian hospital in Romania. I knew I wasn't ever going back in that place again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was like 1980s technology. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm holding the old board up against your chest. I'm like, right. oh. Like, <laughs> but I get the launch stool, spend two weeks, I believe, in launch stool. Not right. They get me back to the States. The Marine Corps flies my wife from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, to my bedside in launch stool in less than two days. Wow. I mean, I call her, I'm extremely sick, and now my wife's on my bedside. The Marine Corps bought my wife for another 15 years because of that act. Yeah. If you think about the you know, husband, wife, family unit, when mm -hmm. you're a senior leader, the Marine Corps bought my wife with the way that they treated our family. And I got it, I'm a battalion commander, and maybe that makes it a little different than some young Marines, but you know, I watched this also happen all the hospitals that I was at, like that, like the, the Marine Corps is such a special institution mm -hmm. because of that. I agree. Yeah. Like it's just something that's, that's something that can't be replicated anywhere. And because we're so small, we can do it differently than other services. My opinion, that's not, that's not downplaying any other service. They're all great. But the Marine Corps is special in that regard, particularly in the officer corps where there's only 21,000 of us. They fly me and my wife back on a C-17 to Walter Reed. I arrive back at Walter Reed and I go another two and a half, almost three weeks. Them trying to figure out 107, 110 temperatures. I'm rapidly declining in weight. They can't figure out what it is. They've tested me for cancer. They've tested me for all kinds of other diseases. They didn't know what it was in Longstall. They thought I might have gotten some rare disease that's found in that part of the world at the time. It wasn't that. They can't figure it out. Ultimately, I'm laying in the bed in Walter Reed and a doctor comes running in and says, we figured out, by the way, I've already gotten bone marrow biopsy. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> so, so like yeah. in my back, like painful, one of the most painful things I think I've experienced. Um, so bone marrow biopsy and the doctor comes running in, nothing out of the bone marrow biopsies. Like when I was going to the bathroom, when I would urinate, it was almost the color of this mic. I mean, it was like dark brown, like black mud. So they end up doing a liver biopsy. Doc comes running in and he says, hey, we found out what it is. It's cancer. I was like, you guys told me it wasn't cancer. So like, yeah. no, it's cancer. Rare, aggressive. You have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, large B-cell, ABC, cancer of the blood. Very rare. Very rare, very aggressive, a really high mortality rate because it's hard to diagnose. So my blood is cancerous. Okay. It's not metastasizing anywhere in my body. It's just running through just my running body. Through, right. So, but the blood itself is cancerous. The only way to cure this thing is chemotherapy. Radiation won't do it. Like you got to get chemo. And most people pass away because it takes them so long to find it. that you know, it's eating your body up. So now I'm, you know, in Walter Reed, doc comes in, tells me you have cancer. He goes, Hey, but here's the deal. Your cancer is so rare. You had the opportunity to become a research protocol patient at the National Institutes of Health right across the street. You know, you got a moment to think about what you want to do. You know, here's like my wife and I look at each other like, we don't have to think about this. Yeah, yes. right, right. Yes. So I donate my body to science and, you know, I go across the street. I take a research pill that, you know, I would say changes my life because January the 1st of this year, seven years cancer free. But I mean, I was, as, as an old mentor who used to be the CEO of the school here, uh, came to see me uh, in the hospital. And he's like, you know, hey, son, you, 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 you circling the drain. You know, I mean, he's like, it's not looking good, Reggie. I need you to bounce back. I, can you I know? interpret that accent and figure out who it was? Yeah, again? You, can, you, can, you can absolutely <laughs> yeah. figure it out. Huge mentor. And, yeah. you know, just great. But, man. but, but, you know. So many senior leaders, GOS was going on, I believe at the time. I mean, I had senior leaders wanting to come see me and sit at my bedside. Like, think about how powerful that is. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm laying in the bed and I look up and 
there's, you know, the president of the United States standing at my bedside. Now, I happened to be years ago his aide at the time. Right. But he shut down the hospital to come sit at my bedside. And that taught me more about the person than anything. I learned more about Marine officers and leadership in that singular act that fundamentally changed my life. Cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me. It refocused me. Okay. It gave me the harmony that I write about in that mentee document that most of my mentees read. When they read that red paragraph up front, a lot of that is predicated off of what I learned sitting, getting chemotherapy for six months. I was on a five-day chemotherapy regimen, 16-day cleanse, five-day chemotherapy, 16-day cleanse, you know, for six months. And in that time, when you get to contemplate about whether you're going to live or die, and I had to reconcile. I mean, I went to Mm -hmm. some dark places, but not as much as you think. I never questioned why it happened to me. I still haven't to this day. Okay. I never went like, oh, why did this happen to me? What's going on? It was just the journey that the Lord put me on. God had a plan. And I think he was probably telling me to slow down many years before that. I'm like, oh yeah, when we get to the next duty station or when I get out of command, Mm -hmm. I'll do this. And like, finally, you know, my fun. He took the hammer to get you to listen. Yeah. Guess what? I'm going to give you some of this. You take a seat and think about what I was telling you, son. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I got it now. Right. So that really taught me a lot about leadership. It taught me a lot about life. It taught me a lot about priorities. The things that you see me doing now, the fervency and zeal, people are like, man, you are always motivated and energetic. I like to believe that I was that way before. And many would say that if I were assessing myself. But more importantly, it became a renewed kind of vigor because I got another opportunity. Mm -hmm. I got another opportunity that came through illness. You really want to know what the institution is about? I had almost 10 months in command when I was the CEO of 3A when I was ill. Let me tell you about this institution and why I love it so much. They didn't have to give me another shot. I'd already gotten an observed fitness report. I was good. Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, Division CG at the time, the MEF CG at the time, the monitor, all call show up and they're like, you beat this thing, we're putting you back in command. I mean, I, frankly, when you're that ill and you're really struggling and you know, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm like another version of myself, I'm like, mm-hmm. thanks for the positive word of encouragement. It'll change your destiny. We talked about that earlier. Uh Uh-huh, right. But truly, when I recovered and I'm getting back, they're walking in. They're like, hey, which battalion do you want to go to? And I'm like, well, you know, because people are already slated. You know kind of how our system works. There's There's a whole thing. Yeah, I'm like, I don't want to take a battalion from somebody. Just tell me where I'm going. It worked out that the person who replaced me at Victor 38 was slated for Victor 18. So I ended up moving to 18. And I went back and deployed them. I had almost 20 months in battalion command of Victor 1A and deployed them to UDP. So I commanded two infantry battalions. Just rare. You want to talk about opportunity, advocacy, and sponsorship? Right. And that's where the sponsorship comes from, right? That's where they said, hey, for the good of the organization, this is going to happen. We've already slated. Whatever they saw, good, bad, or indifferent, Mm -hmm. I didn't deserve that opportunity. No. I didn't deserve it. I mean, I could, you, I could, argue with you, you could say, you could argue, but I'm just telling you from a guy who spent time in manpower and a guy who actually okay. went through that thing. People were upset and mourned for about two weeks and then the institution moved on. Mm-hmm. They could have easily said like, hey, we're good. Like the next guy, next gal in the shoot. Right. But they came back. That's, and I'm here awesome. now because of that opportunity. I wouldn't have got this shot to be here where I'm at now. I'm not saying I wouldn't be in the Marine Corps. Right. But I wouldn't you be, a commanding, here a, commanding I wouldn't be a commanding officer without that opportunity. Yeah. That, that is something that I'm absolutely adamant about teaching young officers here. More importantly, my plug on for you and every other male in particular, get your bodies checked. 
Yeah, I know. Get your body shape. Yeah. It's tough. We're we're all men and we hate to do it, but you know, it's it's women as well, but men sometimes are even more stubborn, you know. And look, I told Doc earlier. Like, hey, I got to get my lipids done. I got to get my freaking blood panel work. I'm doing that all mm -hmm. here in the new year. It's part of what you got to do. Yeah. Um, you got to take care of your body because Marines are counting on you to be able to perform uh, when it matters. But like that was a huge leadership lesson learned for everything you can think of. Everything we've talked about to this point is embodied by that singular experience in 2015. And, and how in those dark times, I mean, in my mind, I was like, well, I was deployed to Romania. I looked at my wife. I'm like, now I'm deployed to Walter Reed. You can actually come visit. I mean, they were flying my wife to come see me. You know, that's something huge for our young officers and young enlisted Marines to think about. Like, yeah. that's the institution that you belong to. Right. And I think some people can get so jaded and bitter by their day to day yeah. you know, bullshit that people put up with Absolutely. the Marine Corps. But like there's a bigger picture there and you just described it and that should make everybody feel good. Who's listening yeah, to this. Yeah, you, you, you're not going to be left behind. Right. Because, because taking care of your Marines isn't something we just say. Absolutely right. not. Yeah. We, we do it and leaders embody it with what they're doing and they weren't just doing it with, you know, somebody will say, well, they did it for you because you were a former uh, infantry battalion commander. I lived in Walter Reed for six months mm -hmm. in Tranquility Hall. I watched senior leaders come and see Marines who were sick, ill, wounded, injured all the time. It wasn't just me. We, we belong to a, a, a phenomenal organization in that regard. And I'm forever grateful. You know, it, it, it changed the pathway for my family and I, you know, and frankly, they bought the, they bought my wife, something I love yeah. being a Marine, you know, they bought my wife. Yeah. She's like, okay, like we're, this is awesome. We're having fun. I'm not gonna, you know, I mean, she's put it all on me now. She's like, Hey, if you get out, it's all on you. You know, right. I don't want to be an old lady looking. You're like, well, you made me get out of the Marine Corps. So she's a smart woman. She's sure. like, yeah, I'm going to put mm -hmm. this on it. Yeah, on right. you. You're going to make this decision. But you know, no matter what happens, this is all bonus round. You know, for me, mm -hmm. I'm in the bonus round. Everything that I've done since that time in 2015 is all extra. And I get to do what I love doing, which is teaching, coaching, mentoring, and leading Marines, right. sailors, and their families. There's no higher honor or privilege. It's just, it's an awesome. That's a great story. Thanks for sharing it. How, how soon after 1-8 did you get promoted to a full bird colonel? Um, so I great? left 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. I went to the Marine Corps War College. I did a year at Marine Corps War College. Great year for those that might be thinking about what TLS to go to. You know, that's my soft plug for, for McWar. It, it was a great year. And then I got assigned to Manpower. I originally went there as a lieutenant colonel, and I was the lieutenant colonel combat arms monitor for a year. Okay. And then I got selected for colonel. The institution, the leaders at the time moved me over to be the branch head for enlisted assignment. So I stayed within manpower, but moved to a colonel billet. Uh, generally in the past, it had been filled by a lot of post command colonels uh, off and on, but I was a really junior guy in a billet that probably could have been more appropriate for a more senior leader who, senior colonel. Right. But the general at the time saw something and asked me to go over there and he had a vision and an intent about where he wanted enlisted assignments uh, needed to go and i got two fantastic years there and right as i took the leadership role there i was selected for tds so i waited two years to take command here at tds so i okay. came into command here a little bit more seasoned than a lot of colonels do M most will get selected and then six months later they're in command I was a two year colonel kind of coming into command. Okay. So, so unique kind of experience it was great. Yeah. You know, and it's played out well for me here now as the CEO. I'm a little bit more mature. I've settled into being a colonel a lot better. So I, I'd like to believe, I hope that it's been good for my subordinates. I, you know? I got but, to imagine it is. Yeah. Huh. You said something earlier I want to come back to. This is funny because when you're older and you say to somebody younger, you're like, I think we're kind of the same age. And then the younger person is like, you're like 10 years older than I am. But I feel like we're kind of the this, this same yeah. generation. I'll go, yeah. Can I take some liberties yeah. there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But because it's a podcast, I need to explain this. You're African-American 
and I'm a 55 year old white guy, right? So I joined the Marine Corps and I just joined the Marine Corps. I'm doing my thing and I'm at TBS and I don't notice anything mm -hmm. because I'm a white guy, right? Yeah. And and then you said before that you're like, hey, there's there were three African American uh, officers in my battalion, and I started like trying to think of all the all the black guys that were in my because it was just guys that back then. And I'm thinking like, it was really underrepresented. I mean, really, there were yeah. like single digits probably yeah. in my. Yeah. So, look, I think I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. I don't think. I mean. I have never had any intention of ever doing anything wrong. Yeah. Like race with, but where, do, here's how, this is a hard question to ask, but where, where did I, where could I have gone wrong and not known it? You know, like, well, so, I mean, look, the, the, the nature of being in the society that we are in, which is phenomenal. I mean, I got asked years ago as a framework for you, about what do I think about the great experiment? America as a great experiment, mm -hmm. i.e. a melting pot and built off of a lot mm -hmm. of backgrounds, diversity from, you know, white and black and Asian and Native American, just like this melting pot. I mean, I'd say the experiment's going pretty well. Mm -hmm. You know, here I am now sitting in front of you as a Marine Corps officer when some years ago, it would not have been possible for me to do so. I mean, we're not that far no, away like what, from like the from 60s. In, let's call it, you know, like right. 40s. I mean, you 40s know, when and then you get yeah. bomb for Point Marines and, and that dynamic. And, you know, Frederick C. Branch, are, you know, our, our earliest African American officers. But so many people pave the way that what you do with the opportunity is what's, what matters. Remember, you know, I mm -hmm. come from a father who's like, don't share my wealth, share my work ethic. Right. I had to work. I also had a dad who was in the military is like, you're responsible for all you do and all you failed to do. We hear that as a Marine Corps, but my dad was telling me that very early on is like, we work too hard for you to blame your situation, good or bad on somebody else. That doesn't mean it's not going to be challenging. And it is, mm -hmm. but I think our institution is making and has made the strides to try to improve that. But remember, we're a volunteer organization. Marine Corps didn't ask me to come. I came to this institution because I believed in what it represented. And I still believe in what it represents. So for me, it's about representation. Okay. I want to be an example for young officers who may not look like you. Right. Who go, that guy did it. I can too. She did it. I can too whether they're in any of the underrepresented, you know, minorities, Asian, Native American, you know, Hispanic or the like, where you could have and where I think we're starting to recognize this now, you know, a lot of this really started with George Floyd and that really sparked this huge diversity, equity and inclusion debate that is going on now and not to go down it, you know, I mean, I'm still a firm believer in, you know, the Marine Corps remains a meritocracy, but we also, and we always have taken other factors into consideration. Mm -hmm. I want this institution to have great representation, not just because of, hey, we need to mirror society, like that may be one factor, but it's the diversity of thought that comes with our ability to solve complex problems on the battlefield that happen because people come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and different experiences. Like that's what you're after. Especially now. Especially now, you know? And when I was doing a DE&I conversation at EWS, two years ago, they asked me to come and be a guest speaker over there at the Expeditionary Warfare School. And they, they specifically asked me to come talk about DE&I. And, you know, as we were going through it, you know, I put this in, in this mentee document, you know, but I'll, I'll read a portion of it because this conversation between me and a white captain, I think encapsulates my personal feeling. This is a young captain now who wrote me an email after we were talking about DE&I. Okay. And I mean, it was a big debate back and forth with captains. They're like, hey, why, why should we be doing this? Why should we be doing that? And, and I'm trying to explain to them, like, it's easy for you to say because you've grown up 
in a system and in a society where you're not overlooked. I guess that's what you're, I was getting you're, at. You're the majority. I, right. When like I everything notice. is kind of built around mm -hmm. you that way. Whereas for me, it's not that way. Some of the things, frankly, that I see, particularly white males dealing with now, having to reconcile with, as an underrepresented minority, I've been doing that since I was a small child. Yeah. It's not new to me. Right. It's just new to them. Mm hmm. They're feeling it now for the first time because they're reconciling with it because it's in the forefront. But this conversation that happened with this young, you know, captain, it's powerful. I, I'll just take a moment. So this is all a D and I discussion at, with a Marine captain at EWS. Are you about to read his emails? Yeah. You're about to do? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. he, he goes, sir, specifically, I was thinking about the question that was asked by multiple officers about whether it is better for the Marine Corps to remain a meritocracy rather than have diversity of the force. You emphatically stated, being me, mm -hmm. I emphatically, as you know, Colonel McClam stated that we could do both. And he said, sir, I agree with you. After reflecting on what would prompt people to view diversity as a departure from meritocracy, vice a reinforcement of meritocracy, I thought that the resistance comes from one of two places. And this is what I highlighted okay. in this thing here. You can see it kind of here. Like it, it yep. boom, it jumped out. Yeah. Of he said, the first place is the fact that many officers have framed diversity as an or discussion. As in, we can be a meritocracy or we can have diversity. In reality, it is an and discussion. Mm -hmm. We need diversity and we need to remain a meritocracy. But really, sir, in fact, it is an in order to conversation. We need diversity in order to maintain the most competitive meritocracy possible. What a powerful statement. Yeah. And I totally agree with it. Totally agree. Yeah. I, I am. White guy, Dave Armstrong, totally agrees yeah. with that. And, right. and, and black guy, Reggie McClam. Yeah. Both so former Marine and as an active duty Marine, you know, I think you can do both. Yeah. I think they're both powerful and important, but you want the representation that exists with it. This is why I think our senior leaders have been going with it. And we are making those strides. Mm -hmm. They're coming. You know, I'll tell you here in just a second to add on to this. It's just not something you can solve in one day, though. You know, we're getting there, though. Right. We have our first. African American, black, four star general, artillery Huge. officer. Huge! I got it. Uh, okay, just I, want to I throw it out there. He, he would know? remind me, you know, as yeah. a mentor of mine, he would remind me often, you know, artillery, infantry, you right? Know, yeah, yeah. You know, but but more importantly, you know, and I can't speak for him, nor will I will, but I gotta believe that he believes it's just the rep, it's it's the representation and the opportunity, because you work there. I know enough about the Marine Corps. They ain't handing out billets to people. Even right. here, when you're assigned an MOS, you have to be suitable and eligible and you earned it. Okay. You earn what you get here. No one's anything, giving it away. Anything else is fake news. All fake news. Yeah, right. You're earning it. Right. But it's also needs of the Marine Corps. So you might not get what you want. I got lucky. Right. You know, when I was a young officer, I tell the lieutenants here, I finished at the bottom of the first third. Worst place you can finish. You get what's left. Right. I think I put my tab on like aviation supply. That's what I got. <laughs> I was optimized by my leadership who saw future potential in me as an infantry officer that I got the opportunity to get my number one choice. Okay. But make no mistake. I just got to believe now being the CEO of TDS, that means that some other officer who had infantry doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. They went somewhere else. I'm not saying that's right. That's why you have to take fair out of the lexicon. Right. Sometimes the needs of the core eats first. Right. And that's okay. What you do with the opportunity is really the key factor. You know, I just want to be, you know, like now, I'm just trying to be a good colonel. Try not to get fired. From a leadership standpoint, you're never in charge as much as you think you are. Right. <laughs> you get fired every day. Of right. Exactly. My yeah. boss get dissatisfied, but not even my boss. The Marines I lead who's go, you know what? I'm done with this guy. I won't last long. Right. I won't get to hear the band play. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you won't great. make it to the band. Right. But let me offer you this. Okay. There are 10 things that I think leaders can do to really create an environment to have healthy discussions about this tough subject. The first one is create an environment underpinned by trust. I think if you create that kind of environment, you have the opportunity to win. Because without trust, people are unwilling to share their experiences or express their vulnerability. All right. And these 10 rules that I'm about to give you, they're not mine. This is created with a group of officers that we were wrestling with this as young colonels when it came, when, when the George Floyd incident came out and we were thinking about what we represent to our institution as p- people who happen to be in this particular ethnic group, this is kind of where we ended up. But I think these rules are really good. The second one, establish a safe space that encourages listening, learning, and growing. I think it goes without saying for that. You know, establishing basic guidelines and norms are critical for practical discussions. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense to everybody. Third, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Like, that's just a rule of thumb for any officer. Like, if you are a leader, you need to be ready to be rejected, oppressed, misunderstood. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a part of leadership. It's not always sure. fun. Right. You just got to get comfortable being uncomfortable because di- discussing diversity and inclusion, it's a heavy lift. It's a tall task for anybody. Right. Because can I just share real quick? Yeah. Want to know one of the most recent uncomfortable moments I've had in my life? Introducing this topic with you. Mm-hmm. It's un. I mean, you, when I go back and listen to this, yeah. I will hear my voice hitch yeah. and say, like, I want yeah, you to get comfortable. Though. Right. Well, because it's hard. It's hard to do dialogue it. Dialogue and discourse. And here's where I tell you, this is the difference between you and I as a white male and as a white as a black uh, male. I'm very comfortable with this topic. Yeah. I've had to deal with this topic since I was a small child. My parents talked to me about it when I was little. Right. I talk to my daughters about this topic right now. I have two beautiful, young, black daughters. They're awesome. But I've had to talk to one who looks at TV commercials and she sees Barbie dolls who don't necessarily look like her and Mm -hmm. a lot of folks. And she's, you know, trying to understand her beauty in relation to what society might be trying to project. What looks right. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you have to do that with your children. I I don't know if another father who might be white has to do that with their daughter, maybe in a different way. They will, yeah. they will have to deal with different issues. So I believe this is universal. I'm not saying that like as mm-hmm. a dad, but that's a unique one. It is. Yeah. To try to explain that like being a black female and your body is okay. Right. I do the same thing with my son. Like you need to be proud to be an African-American male, bud. You know? And, and you're going to deal with those challenges. You I know, didn't mean to throw you off. No, numbers. that's okay. Yeah, go but ahead. the fourth one, use precise language and define critical terms. Precise wording helps participants more accurately share their thoughts while avoiding confusion. If mm-hmm. you don't have the same precision of language and the same critical terms, you'll be two ships passing in the night. You'll never be able to, you'll never be able to settle on this topic in a way that's healthy and mutually beneficial. You have to do that. Words are important. They matter. Mm -hmm. Number five, take time to describe what diversity and inclusion are not. So you got to say what it is. You know, I always tell the folks down there, hey, look, this isn't a quota. When we do MOS assignment, this isn't built about quota. You got to be suitable and eligible. You got to earn it. But a factor is race because we have to make sure that there is representation across all MOSs. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite quote right now, as a leader, I am planting trees that I will never climb or sit in their shade. Yeah, that's so we do the same thing here at Mm -hmm. the basic school. When you assign MOSs, I'm not in the business of creating general officers, but I am in the business of creating future colonels to give the senior leaders a broad and diverse bench to choose from right. of a lot of talent 
to be senior leader. Because today, that's probably still an issue, right? The bench is – You just got to build a bench. Right. It's right. building a bench. Building a bench. And build you can't bench. do that overnight. Can't do it overnight. It takes 20 years. And it takes 25 years, 20, 25 years yeah. of the four ac- the acronym I gave you, mentorship, right. opportunity, mm-hmm. advocacy, and sponsorship. So I'm bringing you back because these things are all tied together. Right. Number six, accept there's no quick fix, but maintain a sense of urgency. That's where I just told you, like, right. sometimes people, particularly this generation, they want, they want it now. Like, fix all the problems right now. That's not a COA. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. We can't do this. You got to take small bites. And I think that's what we're doing. I can't speak for the institution, nor do I, you know, say this is what senior leaders are doing. These are my personal opinions, but I believe that's what our core is doing. A little bit at a time, man, we are making strides because this is a better core now than it was when I entered 25 years ago. Well, that was going to be a question. I absolutely. Yeah. Absolute fact. The people are smarter. The officers, the Marines are better. Without a doubt. Like that's real. That's Number good. seven, identify your biases. You just did that early mm-hmm. on. I know. You already got it. Like you're already win- winning. And it doesn't make me a bad person. No, it just means everybody that, has right, biases. Yeah, I, just, I got them. Right. I have to fight them in the classroom yeah. because there's who you are and how you are. I talk about in the document much earlier on, I'm never trying to change who you are, like your background, your religion, your worldview, all Mm -hmm. that stuff is who you are. But if you're going to lead Marine sailors and their families, you have to adapt how you are, how you present yourself, your tone, your presentation. All of that stuff, you have to change that. I hope everybody rewinds 30 seconds and listens to that again, too. If you don't do that, you're, you're going to struggle. You can't lead people effectively if you can't adapt how you are. Right. The vast majority of the people I lead at this school don't look like me. They don't have the same background I do. Mm-hmm. And it would also be biased for someone to think that another African-American male has the same viewpoint that I do. They may not. Okay. Remember, I'm the sure. byproduct of a military family. I lived all around the world. Yeah, your upbringing was totally different. Totally different. So, you know, that seven, identify your biases is good, whether conscious or unconscious. Number eight, be mindful of your presentation style and tone. Remember how you are? So you got to do that. Avoid offending participants by speaking in generalities like everybody or we all. I don't speak for everybody. Mm -hmm. Nor do you. Right. That's why you got to use precision of language, define your critical terms. When I was in Cornerstone, which is our commander's course, Mm -hmm. an officer there looked at me when the diversity and equity subject came up, which was somewhat contentious, depending on who you were talking to about what we were trying to achieve with the topic. But he goes, Reg, I want to talk to you here about diversity and inclusion. I'm like, okay, sure. And he starts talking. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think we're going to be able to do this in five minutes on this break, dog? Yeah. Like, not real. But I'll tell you what. Why don't you come to my house tonight and break bread with me, Mm -hmm. have dinner, and I'd be happy to do it. You know, Keith Ferrazzi has a great book out there called Never Eat Alone. Yeah. And I use that all the time. Okay. My mentees, we go to Q-Town, we sit down at S&G's, and, you know, we have breakfast together. Yeah. Because when you break bread, it creates the right environment. It creates the safe space to have these difficult conversations, you know. But you got to be mindful of your presentation and tone. Number nine, listen, process, and then listen more. I suck at this. My wife will tell you I suck at this. I'm an extreme extrovert, Dave. So when people talk, like my motor starts churning. It's like, <laughs> I'm I like, all right, hurry up and finish so I can say what I want to say. You yeah. know, I got to sometimes I've had to practice the art of listening. Yeah, I do. And I really pay attention to my senior leaders who I think are really good at this. A lot of the, maybe some would say not all, but I think general officers in particular, they're really, really good at listening. Like it's an art form. And they listen to make sure they ask the right questions. That's a skill set that I am constantly working on here at the basic school. I'm bad bad at it too. Yeah. And here's how I know it. One, I will re-listen to this recording. And if I count how many times I'm talking at the same time you're answering a question, 
I'll bet you it's 20 times. We, we do the same thing. I know. Though. It's right. It's, it's, we just got to get better at it. It's bro. hard. Right. Together. Here's another, if I, if you don't mind me jumping yeah. in, because I know you're, you're almost a 10, yeah. but I don't want to miss this because there's a massive difference between being quiet and listening. Yeah. yeah. Don't mistake being quiet with active listening. Yeah. Because if you're the kind of person who's quiet, but you're formulating in your head what you're going to say next, yeah. you are not listening. Yes. This has helped me with this. Yeah. I, yeah. It is so critical. I, I mean, I can, we get the commandant here to talk to every class and he talks to lieutenants about listening. It's a huge, I mean, if he believes it's that critical with yeah. all of his years in the service, like it's something that we all have to pay attention to when it comes to leadership. And then that last one, yeah. number 10, do your research. Take advantage of the writings, videos, media that provides perspectives and critical for understanding all populations in your workforce. Like just do that. Just do your research. So before sometimes you go ask somebody this hard question, take the time to kind of look and see what they think. You know, here's what I will do for you, though. Before we actually close out, since we're on this topic of kind of the diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. I do want to leave the listeners with something they can use in their toolkit. Yeah. So if you're a young leader and you take those 10 rules that I have, how do you put them into practice? So my argument and what we came up in this document that we passed to some senior leaders is how do you have the conversation about diversity, equity and inclusion? without actually having the conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you're like, come on, Reg, I don't know. Like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you a, a, an opportunity. Yeah. I'll ask you to participate with me as well. Oh, I already read the question. I'm scared to death to answer right. it because I don't want to be wrong. just think about it. Right, yeah. You know? And by the way, before you even go, I'm going to put these, because you've typed these things out that you're about to yeah. I'm going to put them in the show notes of this podcast. Yeah, that's So anybody good. listening can go back yeah, and see these. I don't absolutely. need to write them down right I, now. I'd love yeah. for you to share it. Sure. But if one batter has 50 hits and another batter has 100 hits in a season, who's better? What would, what would the reasonable per person say? Okay, with no other information? No other the information. person with 100. Yeah, of but course. But you need more information. Well, okay. Yeah, Not of course uh, they would, though. Like, yeah. Let's be real. How many at-bats? There you go. Right, yeah. How much better would you say? Well, I guess you could do the math, which I can't do in my head very well, but you could, you could I don't know, four times? Okay. So four times greater than the person with 50 bats. But if I told you the batter with 50 hits had 100 at-bats and the batter with 100 hits had 400 at-bats, does that change your answer? Absolutely. Why? Well, because it's the, uh, the looks that they get. It's okay. that one batter hit the ball 50% of the time that he was at the plate where the okay. other person hit 25% of the time. Okay. And yeah. what is that? One's better than the other. One's better than the other. But how? How are they better than the other? Come on, hit the word for me. You know the word. I'm We've been talking it. about it the whole time here. Like, think about what is happening to the batter who gets 400 at bats, vice the batter who gets. Oh, he's getting the one. opportunity. There you go. Okay, I see where you're getting now. I, I thought you were actually talking about baseball stuff. Okay, yeah. no, but we're talking yeah. about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. We're just not talking about it. Right. You hit the key word: opportunity. Mm -hmm. You see how powerful opportunity is. Right. But you, you had another opportunity is so massive to people's personal growth, both personally and professionally. And just think about that. It's the opportunity that's really unequal. Not it can equal, be, right? It can be. And so that's why I'm telling you how you mentor somebody, how you advocate for them, the mm -hmm. sponsorship you give, you create windows of opportunity for them. Right. Look, I got to be the operations officer of 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines, when I was a young captain. So I commanded 3-8, but I did all my combat deployments as a young captain and major out of there. Mm -hmm. So I came back years later. I already had done two deployments, combat deployments, as a captain. It, on natural rotation, I'm supposed to leave the unit. The incoming CO is like, and I was fully ready. Like the outgoing CO is like, hey, look, I love you, but you got to go. You've been here for two deployments. We got to get other captains who need the opportunity for this role. I sort of got maybe what you would say, advocacy, and maybe you could say on a rim sponsorship. Because mm -hmm. the incoming CEO is like, yeah, you're not leaving. You're going to be the <laughs> ops up. Yeah. I got three back-to-back -back combat deployments. This is huge. Yeah. It's great for me. Opportunity. You know, if you 
continue to play this out, and I won't hit all these because you're going to put it in for the readers, but some of the other questions here are, do you think opportunity plays a role in the number of hits a batter has? That's what we yeah, just hit on. Absolutely. Hit with your question. So, but you had another, so I, I have the luxury of having read this yeah. and the leaders don't. So I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, but can I tell you the one that really opened my eyes yeah. and I'm actually a little disappointed in myself. So I will share mm -hmm. what I did, which is going to immediately tell you how wrong it was, <laughs> right? It's going to, it's going to uncover my biases and, and stereotypes we haven't even talked about. You had a thing in there. You were like, if you're a, a combat unit and you have to go fight in an urban environment or an open farmland environment, and you know what I saw immediately? Southern white person, African-American yeah. who grew up in a city. Yeah. I saw that immediately yeah. when you asked the question. And then I'm like, well, maybe that's exactly what he's getting at there. That's it. But then I started thinking about the question. I'm like, you know, there's some merit in that question because maybe there is some tactical advantage to that. I mean, yeah. if I grew up in Washington, D.C., and – we're out in the full of gap. I don't, maybe I don't have the spatial understanding of defilade. This is or, what I believe the senior leaders who are making us wrestle with all of this as commanders. Think about it. this is the diversity of thought and the representation that matters in solving complex problems. That's where I came to when I saw that's that. What, yeah, this right, is what this right. is all about. Mm -hmm. And immediately you would do that. Like we all have those. You know, my wife would be better at this than me because she teaches a lot of this information in her current role. But this is a part of the inherent bias that people have that makes us who we are, right. which is why you have to read so much. Mm -hmm. It's why you have to expand your thought. You know, readers are leaders and leaders are readers. So you got to you got to read. You got to do your research. You got to really explore this if you want to be effective at leading a unit. Right. It's what makes us so unique as Marine officers, I think. Mm -hmm. It's what makes our institution so powerful. Right. Is that we wrestle with this stuff constantly all the time. Yeah. You know, do you think poor people or rich people are more creative? You see, that kind of question will help you start to deal with D, E, and I in a way that you're not talking about it, mm -hmm. but you're going to bring out all of those key words, all of the premise that's important. Right. You know, but as a white guy, some of those questions scare the shit out of me. Right. Because I'll go back to the urban thing. Right. Because mm -hmm. it immediately uncovered a, a, a stereotype bias that I have. And, and look, I am not a bad person. But what I just said was so blatantly stereotypical or I assigned immediately in my head. Here's the advantage. Not even you thinking have. about it. Here's the advantage you have. You immediately know that you're thinking about it differently. That's all you can ask. That's okay. all I could ask. Well, that is an answer that I really wanted to get. That's all I could ask for you is that you are empathetic and trying to understand where the person is coming from who's opposite you. Right. I try to do that every day. You know, my argument maybe, and I don't know that this is true, but my argument is something that I got a lot of sets and reps in doing this because I've had to do it my entire career. When I showed up and I was in 1-7, mm -hmm. I found out where the talent was at. I looked at officers, many of them who were white, who I was like, that guy is awesome. He's tactically and technically sound. He's got sturdy discipline. He's got all these things that are really, really critical. And I want to be that. Where is he going? Right. If they were going to the country bar out in 29 Palms, they were hitting the 29 Palms Saloon. That's where I was at. Yeah. Because A-type players hang out with A-type players. That is very true. C-type right. players hang out with C-type players. Mm -hmm. I found out, and there were black officers in that crew, too. There were Hispanic officers in that crew, too. Right. I went where they were at. And Because I wanted to be that. There's going to be female officers That's in that right. crew. That's right. Or look, even, I not even today. Look, I commanded the 1st Gender Integrated Infantry Battalion at 1st Battalion 8th Marines. Oh, I didn't know that. Got tasked by, you know, then Commandant. Of the Marine Corps. Oh, man, we're at two hours. Great, I wish I knew that in the beginning. Great, great experience for me as a leader. I yeah. learned more in that time frame. And here's what I will sum it up with. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version so you don't even have to go back and ask the question. You want to want to know? This is what it is. I didn't join the Marine Corps to lead males or females. I joined the Marine Corps to lead Marines and sailors. Amen. See, yeah, that's how I've always felt too. If you're capable of doing your job, 
you're good to go. Yeah. If they were incapable of do doing their job, I would have removed them as the commanding officer of that unit. That's it. Right. Still applies to this day. Yeah. Because that's a policy decision. I don't affect policy. I carry it out. Right. Right. You know? I mean, many of the young Marines probably thought like, here it is. The CO brought the females to our unit. And I'm like, clearly they don't understand the constitution nor how actually <laughs> the system works. Right. You know, we are subservient to our civilian policymakers and that's the way you want it to be. That's what makes us so powerful as a democratic nation. I mean, right. So anyway, I digress. I, I think it's important to sh tell folks that's a way for you. And you can be even more creative about how to talk about this heady subject that makes people uncomfortable, yeah. but you do have to reconcile with as we go forward. At the end of the day, as a Marine officer who just happens to be male, who, and you can talk about, all, this is where we get when you start talking about the inclusion. I just happen to be male. I happen to be heterosexual. I happen to be African-American. I just want to be a good representation for the Marines and sailors and families that I lead. Right. And hopefully that inspires someone to want to do it because Marines are inspired to be what they can see. Right. Here's the rule of thumb. Another leadership quote, paraphrase here. Marines don't often remember what you do. They don't often remember what you say. They never forget how you make them feel. The Maya Angelou kind See, of, right, yeah. They never forget. That paraphrase of Maya Angelou, so true. it's so powerful. I could recall how somebody made me feel 30 years ago That's as it. a second lieutenant. Yeah. They never forget. Mm -hmm. And it's such a small Marine Corps. Right. One of the officers that works here in this command, this officer, 20 plus years ago, I was his SBC. Imagine if I would have left a poor imprint on that officer. Yeah. My reputation and personal brand would have been destroyed before I even took command. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I have said this before, and I know, remember when we were joking around on the phone, I was like, two hours is going to go by like that. Right? By I know, that. right? So, so. I, I was I, wrong. I, so, I know. I, I told you like 30 minutes, man. Okay. Nobody but, wants to hear me talk. But you know what, sir? That. It's good that you realized you were wrong. That's, that's. I was wrong. <laughs> I so, accept it. So I am wrapping up here, but yeah. you just prompted me to ask you two more questions. Okay. So what percentage... I promise the listeners I will try to be succinct. No, no. They, listen, they'll turn it <laughs> off. So what percentage... Well, it, the, the answer is irrelevant. As the CEO here, and you said before, like, you, you're not going to change who you are, but you can change how you are, right? So as an African-American leader here with... I'm going to imagine you're standing in front of a company... Yeah. At least two to 300 students easy right. every time. And at least 70% of them are white, uh, roughly? Am I, 60, okay? 60, 60 some okay, odd okay. percent, I'd say, on average. How much have they changed how you are? Right? Um, like, are you lot. still learning? Yeah. A lot. The Leadership 2 class that I teach on inclusive leader, some of the most difficult questions I get come from that class because we are in especially when they really find out it's a safe space. It mm -hmm. takes a little, that class is two hours long. Right. It probably takes an hour and a half to get them comfortable that they can actually start asking the hard questions. Right. Usually that was one of your 10 we, things. We've ran out of time by the time they start asking the really, and not even asking me, they start debating amongst each other. Right. Because I'm trying to facilitate. Yeah. I want it to be a guided discussion not a lecture. I want it to be where they are actually questioning themselves. And they, they do, they start going like, Hey, look, you need to think about this. You, you're saying that, but you know, think about it from this perspective. They change me often. Yeah. My, my exo would tell you, no one at the school has talked about this subject more than the exo and I, and we have two totally different backgrounds. And I learned more from that officer. He's one of the best officers I've ever been around and he challenges my thought process constantly. I love it. That's great. Cause I get better. Yeah. It makes me a more impactful leader because what it really does, it increases my emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. One of the unwritten rules of leadership or skills of leadership. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'll conclude with this. 
your thing about breaking bread is so right because that's where you get the opportunity to talk with people, yeah. you know, like break out the MREs, go down to the gun line, go down to yeah. the, to, to the defensive position, Grab with a cup of squad, coffee, whatever, whatever it is. is, whatever it is, you do that and, and don't, don't shy away from it. I wish when I had started this topic 40 minutes ago and I said, what could I have possibly done wrong? What did second Lieutenant white Dave Armstrong possibly do wrong? I don't know that I ever thought about it until maybe a day ago when I started reading your questions. And so to just be aware, to read some of these things, like we weren't talking about this stuff when I was a second lieutenant, No, just weren't. And now we are. But the, but the lieutenants are comfortable talking about it. It's they've grown up, thing. they've mm-hmm. grown up with it. Mm-hmm. They've grown up, you know, being much more comfortable. They're much more comfortable with the identifiers and, you know, the pronouns, whether you like it, good, bad, or indifferent, you're going to lead people in this arena. So you just got to understand yeah. it. Right. You know, and, and you got to be comfortable adapting how you are if you want to be effective. Yeah. So I think that's just a challenge for us all yeah. as we continue to grow as leaders and, you know, as parents and as friends. And I mean, like, it's all a part of just the human dimension. It's right. It's it's who and what we are. I was a battery commander when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And, and they gave me this slide deck of like 57 <laughs> slides. Man. And, right, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a battery commander in the reserves. I don't have time for 57 yeah. slides, right? So I get up and I say my thing to everybody. And this Lance Corporal walks up to me afterwards and he, and he says, hey, sir, like, I know you kind of whipped through that because we're pressed for time. But I got to tell you, he's like, you know, none of us give a shit, right? I was like, boom. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's what I would close with because I love quotes and, you know, I love reading. For the listeners, if you haven't read Chop Wood, Carry Water by Joshua Medcalf, this is just a, it's a groundbreaking book for me. I read it when I went to Marine Corps War College. Right. There is a quote in there by him that I'd, I'd close out with because it really, I want to close on war fighting. Because mm-hmm. again, in the institution, if you're not talking about war That's fighting, right. people mm-hmm. are mildly interested. Very few people rise to the height of their expectations. They fall to the foundation of their training. Mm -hmm. what you're training on, what you're practicing every day, like that's what's going to increase your lethality and your combat readiness. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff that we're talking about, whether it's D&I, whether it's, you know, leadership dynamics going on, like you're going to fall to the foundation of the training that you do day in and day out. Your physical fitness, all of that, taking care of your body, being mentally and physically tough you know, strong backs, tough feet, doing all that stuff. Like if, if, if you're not training on it, it's not real. Right. It's because very few people can actually rise to the level of their expectations. Only a really small crew. Those are the people that win like the medal of honor and do something crazy. Vast majority of the people fall back on their training. What are they practicing every day? That's the, that's the beauty of sets and reps. I'm a wash, rinse and repeat guy. Everybody at the school will tell you, Colonel McClam, POI stability, you know, and I'll be known as being probably the plain Jane, you know, TBS CO, because I just believe the ability to replicate sets and reps over and over and over again at the basic school that really is guarded by those five horizontal themes is, is key. Yeah. Like you, you, you have to be able to do this over and over. That's why the, the basic school, apropos, brilliance in the basics, right? having tactical prowess, really, really critical. They could change the name for CACs a hundred different times. It'll never change the name of TBS. <laughs> I'd like to hope that that would happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, hey, Colonel McClam, thank you so much. Yeah, it was for great time. spending and, and, time and with you. Here's a personal thanks. Thanks for giving me the safe space to ask some questions that I wanted to ask. Yeah. And, and I, appreciate, I appreciate you answering them honestly. I think I wish that I had been able to have conversations like this 30 yeah. years ago. So yeah. thanks so much for your time. I mean, I'm jealous of you being yeah. here at TBS and like being able to shape the POI and what these young officers are learning and who they're going to be out and planting the trees that you'll never climb. Yeah. You're I doing that right now. I'm and, trying. Uh, it, I, you, I think you're doing. It's fun. Again, thank, uh, thank you so much for your Thanks, time. Bro. This is this is really great. Absolutely fantastic. fantastic.